You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. In June, 77, moved to the Hits Blocks, and that's when I first met uh, Bobby Sands and Kevin Lynch and Tom McElwee on the hunger strike. All, all I heard was da, 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 but it was like point blank range he was firing, but he was firing at another guy and me, there was two of us. And um, I was hit there and there. There's a couple of thousand of them, we're all shouting, we're gonna rape all them women. And he says, we're gonna burn that church, we're gonna burn that school, we're gonna burn that whole fucking area out. You know, it wasn't about religion, it wasn't a holy war, it was about a territorial struggle to reclaim the six counties to destroy the 300 mile frontier which divided Ireland in 1921. It was to remove that and to free the country. And uh, I've been um, involved in shooting attacks uh, on the British Army, RUC, and also involved in commercial bombing. You know, when you, you look at um, people losing their lives, people taking a life, and the whole diminishing effect of it, you know, trains you. When their cell door opened, only the priest entered, and after a few minutes he left. Within seconds, Brenton Cues, with his voice breaking, shouted down the wing, Bobby's dead. Boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got Seamus Kearney. Seamus, thanks for coming on the show. Okay, thank you, James, for inviting me. Yeah, I've read your book, Powerful, No Greater Love. You spent time in Long Cash, hates blocks, tortured, beaten. You also befriended Bobby Sands, who was involved in a hunger strike where 10 men lost their life. And very powerful book about the struggles and what you get involved in, why you were fighting. And very powerful, but these stories are very dark as well. It's what people have to suffer not just on your side, but both sides. Like, there's a lot of pain, there's a lot of conflict. But your book, book is, it's one of the best reads I've, I've actually read, like, very powerful, very deep. Where can people buy your book, Seamus? Uh, you can buy the book at uh, Calderland Bookshop uh, on the Falls Road, West Belfast. And we're also selling it in Little Acorn Bookshop in Foyle Street in Derry. Those are the two main hubs. That's it, really. How was it writing your book? Um, it was... I started it, um, it took four years, so I um, started in 2017, in the autumn of 17, and uh, I had notes from when I first got out, and I went into the attic and found them, so a lot of that was, a lot of the book was actually wrote back in 1987, you know, it was just a matter of putting it all together and putting the beginning, the middle and the end to it, so that building up a structure, but the actual detail I had from 1987, and I wasn't ready to, to, to put that book down on paper back then, because I was coming out of prison, I was trying to rebuild my life. And to be honest, I wanted to move away from it and forget about it. Mm -hmm. So I didn't revisit it until 2017. Just kind of put it in the back of the mind and just forget it ever existed. Yeah, because it was too painful to revisit. And uh, every time I went back to it, I couldn't handle it, to be honest. It was just too complex. To, um, uh, for, for me, it was, and for a lot of us, um, it was cataclysmic, that whole period. Mm -hmm. I always go back to the start of my guest, Seamus, where you grew up and how it all began. Well, I was born in uh, East Belfast. It was known as Ballamacarrot and uh, before Khartoum Street. And uh, there's my mom, myself, uh, a sister, aunt, um, my two brothers, Michael and uh, Sean, they were twins. So there was my mom and dad and four of us. And uh, we lived over in, it was an area called St. Matthews, St. Matthews Parish in East Belfast, sometimes known as Ballamacarrot area. But um, there was about 3,500 people there, living in there. They're all nationalists and um, surrounded by 30,000, 40,000 plus loyalists, Protestants, you know. It was always a sectarian place. It had a long history of sectarianism, as I've described in the book, way back into the, the, the 17th century. And um, But when the Industrial Revolution came, um, Harlem Wolf was built up around St. Uh, Matthews. And uh, there was like... Uh, up, uh, at one time, there was like 30,000 uh, workers in Horn and Wolf, but there was very few Catholics. So it was um, very, uh, it was a very sectarian uh, area that I lived up 
in completely surrounded by loyalists. And I used to wonder when I was getting chased, when I went to Templemore Avenue Library um, and getting chased from it, and then when I went to Victoria Park and then getting chased from it, I was wondering why I was running. <laughs> I was always getting chased by people and they were always shouting Finians. And I didn't know what a Finian was. So we're talking when I was like five and six. So I said to my mom, what's a Finian? And uh, she says, why you ask that for? She says, I'm always getting called a Finian every time I go to Templemore Avenue um, Library or Victoria Park or the bus. And it was just so claustrophobic living in that area, you know, because any road you went out of the four roads, you were getting chased. And that's from an early age. So um, uh, my, my father was a brass molder. He was one of the, the, one of the very few token Catholics who'd worked in the shipyard. He had a trade uh, as a brass molder, but he was paid off uh, around 1965, uh, about 64. And um, he, he got a bit hard bitten over that, you know, because he lost his job. And he, he, he said to the management at Harlem, if I could retrain and the, they weren't interested, they were just getting rid of him because of his religion. So he tried to join the police. My dad was six foot, I'm six foot two. My dad was six foot two. And uh, he looked like a he looked like a police officer. He only wore the long Daxter coat. So the police, the, the plainclothes cops used to always nod to him because they, they thought he was a policeman, you know, and um, plain clothes. So uh, he went anyway to join the, the police and uh, they refused him. And when I came back on the form, it, it says um, poor eyesight. My dad had perfect eyesight. So he said to my mum, uh, I've perfect eyesight. They have knocked me back over poor eyesight. And he says, it's not your eyesight's the problem, it's your religion, as my mum said. And he became a bit hard bitten over that, but he always taught us. So he always taught us uh, the integrity, or, you know, uh, he taught us values, values of integrity, honor, um, faith in God, faith in country. And um, we always went to mass, Holy Communion. <laughs> He was in the he was in the St Matthew's Church, and I mean, he brought me to mass on it three times on a Sunday, and I used to say, Dad, we've already been to mass twice this morning. Why are we going back? He says, All these masses are going to be built up for you in heaven, son. You know, so he's a very devout Catholic and believed in his country, but he also believed in his God, and he instilled in that. He instilled that in us. How was that then? If family members are getting sacked because of religion and struggling to put food on the table, like, did you see that from a young age? Does that make you angry that things were going on from a very young age, or, did you, or were you oblivious to it? I was oblivious. I, I, I wasn't rationalising it. I was just wondering why um, we weren't able to get a fish supper from the van, or why we weren't able to get, you know, ice cream things like that. But there was a, there was poverty there, like in the family. But then everyone was going through the same. And uh, at that time, that state had been run from 1921, uh, the Protestant state for a Protestant people. So Catholics were just basically regarded as, as blacks living in the deep south. And they were just, um, they, weren't re they were regarded as uh, uh, just persons, you know, persona non grata, um, just non, non people. And to be honest, they weren't politicized. They weren't really that well educated because it was denied them. So they didn't have real rational thought. My mum and dad used to just accept it. We I used to, I used to be wondering like, and later later on when I look back on it, why are they accepting this? But at that time it was like half a loaf better than none. That was the old attitude. You know at the time, mm -hmm. um, you know whatever you have, just make make the best of it. So we didn't really want to rationalise why we were poor. Yeah. Or, or, you know. So did anybody we accepted ever, it. Did anybody ever try and make a stand then? Uh, or was it just like you say accepted? It was generally accepted. There was a attempt in 1956 by the IRA for a border campaign. It was codenamed Operation Harvest. It went on until 1963, but it didn't gain popular support, and it pattered out. The and in the state, you know, the the RUC, um, which was the the political wing of the um, the Unionist Party, they just came in and stamped it out on the Special Powers Act, which were so draconian. They were even, uh, I mean. The clerk had actually said, I'm from South Africa, I wish I had the Special Powers Act to deal with these blacks in South Africa. I mean, that's how draconian the Special Powers Act were from 1921, and they just kept kept getting renewed right up until 72, when Stormont collapsed, and then it was direct rule. But from 21 to 72, they were using the Special Powers Act to keep us down. And um, even if you put a flag out, you're getting arrested. You weren't allowed, because they regarded that as a breach of the peace. So you weren't allowed to fly your national flag. It had to be a union flag. You weren't Irish, you were British. And um, and then, as I say, when the, the IRA tried 
to uh, break the chains in 1956 to 63, they were they were uh, they were uh, squashed, and they, were, they didn't gain any real popular support anyway. That was the problem. Did you see many beatings when you were a kid for uh, people maybe putting a tricolour out? Uh, yeah, uh, I remember around it was uh, 64, and uh, my, my, me and my dad were up in Falls Park. And uh, we had to go back across the town, over the Queen's Bridge, over the east, from West Belfast to east. On a Sunday, sometimes you would have went to the Falls Park. And um, But coming down anyway, Dewa Street, I remember the police were batting, battering people with battens, you know. And my dad was really angry. Yeah. And um, I don't know why they were battening them. But they were getting hit over the head with sticks. The police were doing that, battening them. And um, apparently it was over putting a tricolour in the uh, Sinn Féin office. They were displaying it, and uh, the police went in to take it out. And it was a rat, and uh, it's known as the tricolor rat. And uh, my dad, he came back and he was raging, you know, saying about the brutality of the police. He always instilled in us about uh, this thing about national identity. He says, if you haven't got a national identity and you haven't got a culture, then you're not worth living. You know, there's no pulse to your life. You know, so he always instilled in us that passion for your country, to be proud of it, be patriotic. Not in a negative sense, just be proud of where you're from. You're not British. He would tell us, my, me and to lesser degree Michael and Sean, because they were younger than me, he says, you're Irish and um, you're actually living in an occupied area. I was aware of that from an early age. He used to bring us around to my Uncle Johnny in Chemical Street and he was in the old IRA. And I always remember looking at the, the painting on the wall and it was, uh, it was the ambush of in Belle in August 1922 of Michael Collins being shot. During the, the old IRA campaign uh, from 1919 to, um, 1919 to 22. But he was killed in Bell anyway in August 1922. And I said to my uncle Johnny, what, what is that? And he says, that's the ambush of Michael Collins during the Civil War in 1922. So there was always that, there was imagery around me, you know, paintings or mm -hmm. a song or uh, an indicating where I'd come from. You're Irish. Could it never have moved area? We weren't... You know, he had lost his job. He was mm. working as a, a labourer then in Townsend Street on a pittance. So, and he was renting that house and he had no savings. He just had, he, there was no real social mobility then, mm -hmm. you know. What were you like at school, Seamus? I liked school. Um, I was in St Matthews Primary and then went to St Augustine's uh, Secondary and excelled in um, history. I loved history and English language and English literature. That's where I got the, that's my forte. Mm -hmm. history, military history in particular. I was studying it, First World War, Second World War. We weren't really taught anything about Ireland. It was the, the kings and queens of England and Britain's history of Ireland. So there was no sense of nationalism or we were taught that the British were meant to be here and we were British citizens. And, um, you know, that's the history they taught us. It was okay for the British to be here. It was just my dad telling me otherwise. He was mm. just simply saying, don't be, <laughs> don't be listening to that. Yeah. You know, you're actually Irish, you're not British. But when we went to school, we were taught, you're British, you're British citizens. Do you think that to brainwash the kids to accept, maybe? Yeah. Part of brainwashing, because yeah. I don't believe in any sort of wars, but when you do look at the British history, they've invaded over 90% of the, the countries on this planet. Like, there's a lot there. They're a very powerful country. Was there any kids who was maybe... Um, reading that and then believing in it and accepting it as you say I'll, I'll see when you were kind of going into the history archives and going through the history books did you see certain patterns or, or did you start to understand okay wait a minute there's something not quite wrong here I'm staying in Ireland why is it run by the British like, did you start what age did you start questioning that well it was in school or my history teacher Mr Carey was, was he was more open uh, about uh, maybe third year, he, he was he was asking the class what was their view on certain subjects. And I remember one guy says, um, why is Britain occupying Ireland? And this is before the Troubles, which came in 69. And uh, he said, I remember him saying, God give Ireland uh, to the Irish and he give England to the English. So what's England doing occupying Ireland? But it was skimmed over. Um, but he, Mr. Kerry was always saying in history, try to articulate, try to find a rationale, just don't accept, you know, dates and figures and this is what happened. So he, he was more into start questioning st stuff. So that's what I started doing. And then it was about then under Mr. Carey, I would ask questions like, why are they here? 
and he was saying, well, they arrived in, tw in the 12th century and they've been here ever since. So what is the history of the IRA? When did they actually start? The, the IRA started in 1916. So um, way back, over 100 years? Yeah, 1916. Mm -hmm. And they were formed out of the IRB, the Irish Republican Brotherhood. And uh, it was at the GPO, when, the, when the, the hoisted the, the Green, White and Orange flag, the IRB, the Irish Volunteers, became this am amalgam known as the, this amalgam became known as the Irish Republican Army, 1916, under the likes of uh, Pierce. The Irish Citizen Army, 300 of them, they were part of that uh, under James Connolly. But in general, it was, they were loosely known as the Irish Republican Army. So they go back to 1916. Mm -hmm. And then from that, you had the, the GPO, you had the, the Easter Raisin, which was, which was uh, smashed and the leaders then executed. And then you had uh, 1919, January 1919, the, the beginning of the, the War of Independence, where um, Sinn Féin had actually won the elections in, in, in 1918, uh, two years after the, the, the Easter Rising. And, um, and then they basically set up Doyle Earn and basically said they called on the British to withdraw and because they had won the, the mandate as they seen it in the vote of 1918 where the vast majority was a big swing towards Sinn Féin. And they're, they're, you know, they were basically saying to the British to vacate. The British wouldn't vacate. So in January 1919, they, 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 um, they said we're in a state of war now with Britain. So they had, the British government had their cutting edge, known as the British Army. And the, the Irish, by that stage, uh, January 19, had their cutting edge, known as the Irish Republican Army. And they went into action at Solihead Beg. That was the first incident in January 1919. So that went on for two and a half years. In January 1919, Lloyd George, the Prime Minister at the time, says, um, very similar to today, history has a terrible ha habit of repeating itself. Yeah, patterns. Patterns. So in January 1919, he asked his GOC of land forces, um, can we destroy, can we defeat the IRA in the field? So we're at the period now is 10 Downing Street, it's January 1919, January 1921, um, two years into this war. And uh, he says, give me another six months and I'll have them hammered. You won't have to negotiate with these people. I'll crush them. And by July, he hadn't crushed them. And with the black and tans causing more, you know, burnings and carrying out atrocities, Churchill himself said it wasn't so much the IRA, it was the atrocities of the black and tans that brought us to the table and international pressure from America, very similar to the war, which was to later come here with the provisional IRA in uh, the 70s. But um, so they, they seated for peace, uh, Lloyd George, and then that, that, that ceasefire came into effect in July 1921. And by December the 6th, 1921, there was an Anglo-Irish Treaty, which basically partitioned the country. So the North, six counties in the North were separated and they remained under British rule. And unfortunately for me and my family, we fell on the wrong side of the line. So 1919, it all kick started. Then he's got peace again. But then 50 years later, we go forward to 1969. Trouble started again. How old were you? Um, I was about 13. So you started then. You started that. You joined the Irish Army at 15. Is that correct? Uh, well, I, I joined the the uh, the the uh, Nafina Army, which is the junior wing of the IRA, uh, in 1972. So I was 15. In 1972 and um two two years earlier was 13 and that's when i first remember things happening um but it was like 12 or 13 i remember looking outside the the primary school window of uh the primary school and i seen all these lorries appear that's the first my my first indication of uh the british army arriving and there were all these trucks and they all started coming out with the rifles and the teacher was saying, right, everybody away from the window. <laughs> but everybody was like, Jesus, this is something big. Mm -hmm. A whole convoy of, of British military, which had never been seen before. So my brother, Michael and Sean, both of them were in the Jeeps and the Brits were showing them the rifles. But I never went near them. I never went near them. And my aunt Vera, my mom's sister, always said, the reason why you didn't go near them was because your father, he had taught you that that's not your army. They're occupiers. They're, they're not. That's not the Irish army. That's not your army. So subconsciously, I didn't go near them. And um, but my dad had died um, in 1967 um, when I was 10. So he died of a brain hemorrhage. So uh, there was just my mum left and uh, and uh, the three boys and my sister. So um, uh, they, they arrived anyway, and uh, everyone started giving them tea. And that was August 69. 
and um, they were known as uh, a peacekeeping force. That's what we thought they were. And uh, I, I remember the whole of Sir Matthews, Short Strawn, they're all coming out with tea and buns and biscuits, giving them. They were glad to see them because of the hated RUC, which was the sectarian force. They were hated. They were known as the SSRUC. So once the British Army right, they were coming, they came in as a, like a peacekeeping force, like a UN peacekeeping force. So we thought, and everyone thought, good, they're our saviors. But uh, the following year, um, June 1970, um, me, my, my brother Sean, he, he he came in and he said to my mum this day, um, they're they're carrying boxes into the the pub facing the the Protestant pub facing the church on the Newton Arch Road, and my mum says, "What are you talking about?" She said, "Mum, I seen those loyalists carrying boxes into a, a pub." So she told me to go around and get my uncle Johnny um, in Chemical Street, who was in the old IRA, and he sort of. He looked after us after my dad died in 1970, or sorry, 1967. So this is three years later, 1970. And um, Johnny called around and I had my ear to the kitchen door and, and he says, Kathleen, keep the boys in, the, the, the girl in. He says, there's going to be trouble. There's a couple of thousand loyalists on the front of the road and they're going to, they're going to invade the area. There's only 3,500. It's a small enclave. We live directly behind the church. So um, so we could, we could hear the, the crowds gathering. And, and she started panicking. He says, don't be worrying, Kelly. He says, we've guns and we're going to use them. The area will be defended. So um, the loyalists didn't realize that. They thought, sure, Catholics don't have guns. They just get beat. And the RUC supports them, you know. So you're totally vulnerable. So um, the saviors on that night, June the 27th, 1970, didn't come in the form of uh, the British Army. For me, it came in the, before, in the form of the Provisional IRA. And that's who defended the area. They were all in the, the, the church grounds. And uh, my Uncle Johnny, has, he was there that night. And um, he says, he told my mum later that there's a couple of thousand of them. We're all shouting, we're going to rape all them women. And he says, we're going to burn that church. And we're going to burn that school. We're going to burn that whole fucking area out. And, there's, and the RUC are going to support us. They're going to help us. And Johnny, George, my Uncle Johnny, George, seen them, seen the, the RUC and the loyalists in the area. The British Army were asked, why did you pull out? You had a, a, a little infantry regiment in there. He says, oh, there was uh, trouble elsewhere in the city. We had to pull the, the troops out. So we were left. Alone. Alone, exposed. And there was going to be a full frontal attack on that church and the area. So the only ones to defend us was the people themselves. But they didn't realize that the IRA had guns. And the IRA, everyone at that time was writing on the wall, IRA, I ran away. They were known as Carly, the IRA because they didn't defend the previous year, the likes of burning out of Bombay Street, Farrington Gardens and things like that. People were just getting burned out. So people were going, well, the RUC don't support us. The British Army doesn't look like we're supporting us. And the IRA, I ran away. It was all daubed on the walls. So this was going to be their um, baptism of fire, the provisional IRA. And um, they were all lying in the, the, the grounds anyway, and they invaded. And about 11 o'clock, uh, we were in our, the bed. And I could see out onto the front of the road from the side of the church. And all you heard was bang, 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 bang. That's the first time I ever heard shooting. The three of us all went to the window. And bang, 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 bang. It was scary. And uh, my mum came up the stairs and she says, get under the bed. You know, there's a real fear. And myself, Sean, and Mick got under the bed. And it went on. Two by five that morning. I, uh, the gun battle just went on and on and on shooting. And um, then you start seeing flames coming from the front of the road. And then I remember around five, coming out from under the bed, went to the window, seeing the red glow in the night sky. And uh, I heard one, one of, it must have been one of the provisional IRA guys shouting, if you come any near, you orange bastards, I'll not be firing over your heads. And um, there was people killed that night, you know, but um, on both sides, but uh, they were staved off and, um, the next, the next morning when we went round to Mass at St Matthews, you couldn't go near the front of the road because it was on fire and the gates had been knocked down and um, it just looked like a Second World War, something like a real just battle scene and burnt out cars, the bar across the street was on fire, the Saxton's house, it was on fire. So we went in the side for Mass and, um, but uh, after, the, after the Mass, um, we all started streaming home. But we were all wondering, who did that? 
Who, uh, it wasn't the British Army. Nasha, they pulled out. Who was that? It was a provisional IRA, along with this, uh, with uh, a, 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 a one of my relatives, actually, as well, called the Citizens' Defence, uh, a guy called Jimmy George, who, who and, and Johnny George, who was my uncle. So they were, I was, it was like family members were defending the area, along with the, the provisional IRA under the likes of Billy McKee. He was one of the founding members of them. So it was just getting formed, the mm -hmm. IRA, and they were, they were moving in the defensive role. That was their first role. And uh, we thought, Jesus, they're our saviors. Yeah, so, so that was to make a stand that people were going to come in, they were shouting, I'm going to rape your women, I'm going to kill you. Like, how hard is that for a mother who's got three sons, the father's not there to protect, you're seeing bullets, you're starting to see dead bodies. Like, how hard is that as, as a family unit to see that, especially at 11? Because obviously when you talk as well, I can see it, there's obviously some pain behind your eyes and rightly so. Like, a lot of people don't know the history of between the IRA and the British Army, like it goes deep in it, I think. I don't even know if it will ever pass. It's, it's okay for us in Scotland that we're only a couple of hundred miles away, but when you actually listen to the stories, you realise how ruthless and how dark and how bad it was. And this was only just a few years ago. Like, That's it's true. It's unbelievable to think that that was yeah. still going on. Like, it's modern history. Yeah, how is that, that? How hard is that though for a mother? There, there must have been a lot of tears and worry for a yeah. mum who's got three sons. Like, how hard is that? Well, my mum, uh, after it was over, um, Johnny came around to the house again. And uh, he says, I don't think I could stick much more of this. I need out. And he says, well, Kathleen, you've got the, us here. We've staved them off. She says, I know, but they're going to come back. You know, and so uh, my cousins, Michael Kearney, he was my surrogate dad. He took over. I was my brother's, my dad's brother's son. He came over and um, he says, Kathleen, maybe it's time if you want, do you really don't want to stay here? And she says, look at the edge of them. No, she says, I want them out. But she says, well, we'll try and get them out in the West Belfast. So she thought by getting us out of there, she would, you know, getting from, it was actually from the frying pan into the fire. But she thought she was saving us by getting us out of that area, that enclave. And uh, we ended up on uh, the refugee huts on the Glen Road uh, the following year, and that was in March. What was that like? That was rough. It was like traveler. The travelers ended up in them, and um, it was really basic, no heating, just like prefabricated wee shellies, like a caravan, you know, and uh, that's where we ended up. But she felt we we're at least safe. She's been attacking the kids. But you've you got to understand too, James, that we're, we're living in abject poverty here because my dad's dead. Mm -hmm. There's just no, there's no money at all. We were taking handouts, you know, from anybody who was called to the house. My dad's friend, who was a, a Protestant businessman called Ernie Burns, he used to come around, give my mum money. And then her, 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 her sisters would come over. Fear, and help out. Help out. But she was like living on the real abject poverty, you know. So you joined at 15? But very young, still a young boy. Like, yeah. Who, who, so how did that process happen? Did somebody approach you or did you just want to make a stand and try and join something to, to then try and whether protect your family or protect whatever it is you were fighting for? Well, when my dad died in 67, I was at my dad's coffin and looking at him and me and Vera and my mum's sister, me and Vera and her, my mum was like hysterical and Vera turned around to my mum and says, Seamus is going to be the man of the house. He's going to replace you. That's what happened in those days, mm -hmm. you know. The, the 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 eldest son became the 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 man the, of the house. The man of the house. So my mum then, I remember, still see her with her eyes all streaming with tears, going, "That's right, son. You're you're going to be the man of the house, aren't you?" Here's me. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I can do that. I'll do that. You know. I thought I I'm going to look after this family. <laughs> you know. But uh, um. And that's what was my, and that was in the back of my mind, and that's what I had been doing, sort of looking out for the two boys and things like that, and my sister. And um, but uh, there was a war now starting. I was trying to do household chores in the middle of a war, and internment came in seventy one, and um, so we had actually that happened. Just getting the dates right. That was um, nineteen uh, seventy, June nineteen seventy, the, the the Battle of St Matthews. My mum leaves the following year, and that was March 71. And then we had internment in August, and all hell broke loose. And we were right in the middle of it. And she says, Jesus, Mary and Joseph, I thought I got you out of the fire. But yeah, she got us out of the fire, into the, from the frying pan into the fire. So 
the whole of West Belfast then was in an uproar, gun battles, um, riding and everything else. We were stuck in a refugee hut on the McLean Road. So the, 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 the pivotal moment, probably the first pivotal moment was the Battle of St. Matthews, but I didn't get involved in anything because I was too busy looking after the family. And then uh, the following year was January 72. And that same month we got out of the, the refugee huts and we, uh, this family were leaving, the Hamels they were known, they were called, they were living on 23 Glenvay Drive in the estate facing the Glen Road, Lanadown. And uh, they left, they were going to England because they had enough. A lot of people were doing that. They were just getting out, you know. And uh, so my mum was offered the house and she had a squat in it. So it was illegal. You just went into the house and stayed there. And squatters, right? Squat, squatters, right. So we moved out there in January uh, 1972. So at the end of that month, I uh, came on the news. We were all sitting watching TV and the reports were coming in from Derry that 14, 13 people were shot dead. And not so much my sister, but me, Sean, and Mick were sitting watching that. And we were identifying them. There are there are people, if you know what I mean. We weren't really brought up to be selfish. See what happens to them happens to me, if you know what I mean. So we took that personal. Those are our people. They're getting murdered. And my mum says, that's enough. She switched the TV off. She says, go to your room and cool off the whole three years. So we went upstairs and here's our Michael. Need to do something about that. Sean said the same. Here's me. I know. But I was older. I says, just calm down, all right? Maybe my mum is right. Maybe you can't do anything. Maybe that's what we are. We're just second class citizens. I have to live with it. Here's what are you talking about? You mean you're going to have to do something? You're just murdering people. You're just going to accept it. So that's what, but that was the reality of it, you know? And, um, so uh, I remember Evan Cooper came on the news uh, that night and that's always stuck with me, what he said. He says, I want to address the British government now. And he says, I was up in Derry and Bernadette Davlin was sitting with him. But I remember the words, I memorized them. He says something like, um, I want to now address the British government. He says, you know what you've done, don't you? You, you have just destroyed the civil rights movement and you've given the provisional IRA its greatest victory. He says, tonight, all over this city and beyond, young men, mere boys, are lining up to join the IRA and you will reap a whirlwind. And I went, but he's talking about me. He, he, he's talking about me. And um, so I made a choice. Um, try to keep the house together, and but at the same time, try to resolve the human rights issue. I thought I could do everything then. Mm. You know, I thought I was superhuman. At 15? Yeah. I sound like my, my kids are 12, man, and I try and protect him as much as I can. Like even the slightest little thing I get, you, you worry over, but mm -hmm. I could never imagine them looking out the window and seeing gunshots and houses and fire and tanks driving by. Like it's it's mad to think that kids actually went through that and mm -hmm. kids as young as 15 like, want to join and, and make a stand to try and fight for their own beliefs and believing that Ireland should be Ireland and rightly so I believe all countries should be independent now I think everybody should try and make a stand and try and make each country flourish like it's mad to think that some countries are still real but that is what it is and I'm not a politician I don't know all the answers but for me personally same as Scotland I'd love a bit of independence and I believe the country could thrive anyway with independence um, but for yourself at 15 like how did you then join like what's the procedure to do that um, well it took it, it it takes you three or four months because you have to go through a vetting process. But I, I made a conscious decision. Uh, it wasn't an adventure. And I knew what I was doing. And I knew what my dad had said. I knew that right is right and wrong is wrong. It's quite simple. And um, I felt what I'm going to do, I'm going to, I am actually going to save my people. That's what I'm going to do. Because they can't do it themselves. I'm going to do it for them. <laughs> Yeah. That was a mission. And that how, was my mission. And what's it when you did? Who was leading it then? Who did you have to go to? to um, the, and the it was a provisional IRA. The chief of staff at that time was uh, Sean McDoyfin, and then you had other guys around him like Dahi O'Connell. But then you had the the, the army council, then the brigade, the battalion, the company. So I approached the the company level. That was the F Company in that area, first battalion. And um, they says because you're 15, we wouldn't accept you in the army. 
but you can go into the, the junior wing, which is called Nafem Aran. Uh, you don't get accepted into the army until you're 18. Uh, some got in at 17, a couple of my mates got in at 17, but in general, it was, they wouldn't accept you until you're 18. And again, they're not interested in mediocrity. They're not interested in mediocre people. They're not interested in people who are singing blooming songs and getting drunk. They're not interested in them idiots. They're interested in soldiers, potential soldiers who are going to fight a war. So uh, that's the vetting process comes in. And so, but the, the best soldiers always came from the Nafain Aaron as the war later proved, because that was the 27 year war, believe it or not, James. Mm -hmm. That went on a long time. It started in January, 1970, the provisional IRA military campaign. And it, it, it ended in July, 1997. That's 27 years. That's a long war. Britain, British, the British Army's longest war in its history. And for you, you needed dedication, you needed commitment, you needed a high caliber of troop to do that. And I was one of them. And uh, there was people around me who were of the same caliber. And um, the idiots, they were just shredded out, weeded out. And, um, but I approached the, the OC of F Company. Someone told me, why don't you go up and ask such and such? So I just said, is, um, uh, is there any possibility of joining the IRA? No, you're only 15, but if you want to join the FNR, and that's easier to get into. It's like a Boy Scouts, but they'll train you, they'll train you up. So I remember taking the oath to the Irish Republic, you know, and I, I actually meant it. See, when that oath, I said it was to defend the, the Irish Republic and uh, against foreign enemies, you know, domestic and foreign enemies. And uh, it was to establish a republic and for the British to, you know, to, be, to, to vacate Ireland. And, you know, so I remember the oath anyway and I said to myself, right, I'm, I'm going to stand by that oath. It was like getting married, you know, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. Yeah, devoting your, your, your life basically. You to, have to devote to die your life. for something that you yeah. truly believe in. Yes. What was the training like? Because when I had Sam Miller on, who I've got a lot of respect for, that Sam was talking about, it's not a case of training and you're forced to hate someone, you're educated on what you're doing and it becomes more political. That were you, was it not just a case of, look, there's a gun going out and fighting and shoot anybody that's that's British, like, how's the process of that going through that? Are you educated on what you're doing in like 15, like, to, yeah. it is, it's well, mental it's hard thinking to, to just, to even be accepting a 15 year old and to be going to go through junior ranks or whatever mm. to then becoming, but for a 15 year old, what was it? what did you have to go through to then go well, through the training progress? You had to go through a few security lectures and then they give you a bit of a history of the, of the, uh, the island, you know, of colonization. And um, from the 12th century up, brief. But basically, this is where we are. This is the, that's the enemy. That's a clear enemy. It's the British. The loyalists are not your enemy. We are, we are Republicans. So I've never been sectarian. And uh, the people who were in the army with me were not sectarian. So you were, you were politicized, even at an early age. I, I was getting taught about separatism, republicanism, nationalism, socialism, you know? Mm -hmm. And you weren't allowed to go near guns. But, but you were given gun lectures, yes, but you weren't put out in operations. You shadowed the, the gun crews. So I went out, went out with a guy called He was, I shadowed him. He was in the IRA. Uh, he died of cancer there about three years ago. So he would have said to me, you'll shadow me. And that's all I did. All I did was carry his weapons, like an armalite, carbine, whatever he was carrying that night. And I, I would go to the firing point and he would say, right, give me the armalite. And I would give him any open fire. I'd be standing beside him, you know. So things like that there. And um, but you weren't actually firing weapons, you know. You were getting trained up in them. But you were getting, as I say, the best troops from the IRA came through the Fena. A lot of them came from the the fifteen year olds, mm -hmm. you know, from an early age. They were trained yeah. up. How hard is that? Because Catholics and Protestants used to speak before. Yeah. And when it starts getting divided, when you start getting the borders and you get barriers put up, like, how hard is that just to totally disconnect from maybe friends you've been with for 10, 15 years as a kid to then, were you told not never to speak to them again? No, well, that's a strange, that's a strange uh, comment because I remember my mum always saying when we were in the prom, uh, so this is before even the war started, she would go up on Newton Arch Road, which is all Protestant, and she would go to the, the baker, the, the, you know, the baker, the butcher, the candlestick maker, uh, all these different little shops. And they were all saying, oh, Jesus, Kathleen, how are you? The twins are looking great. Oh, she must look, look at these he's growing. And then you go into the, get your hair cut and they're all great. But see, come the 12th of July, my mum always said, they stop talking to you. She always noticed that. So it was always there. No, that's sectarianism. Mm -hmm. And even if it was passive, it was always there. It was always bubbling under the surface. 
you know, because this was an artificial state set up for a, you know, a Protestant people, for a, a Protestant government, for a Protestant people. We were never welcome. And that's, we were tolerated, but never welcome. Yeah. It's mad to think, even here that like, we've got Celtic Rangers and the hatred between both mm. clubs, but when you actually break it down, there's not a lot of people actually know the history. People are just jumping on board. Like you say, when people want to join IRA, they'll weed out the people who are just there for a party or do whatever, but yeah, when you actually Thatcher. understand what, what the fuck people went through, the destruction, the pain of losing loved ones, and both sides have done a lot of destruction. Like We have to be mm. honest here, yeah, like, yeah. both sides have caused a lot of pain, a lot of misery. Mm. But we actually break it down and understand the history of it, where it started, how it started, who's behind it. Like it goes deep, and that's why I laugh at Celtic because I I have felt it with family members. Like I've got family on both sides, and yeah. we can hold grudges and things get says and the hatred. Even when the football's one, that there's pure hatred there. Yeah. And but a lot of the people with the hatred don't understand what they're actually hating on because mm -hmm. you're from Glasgow. Like why are you getting involved in whatever if something else? It's not really irrelevant to yeah. you. You've kind of been. I don't know whether that's conditioning to be raised with the hatred on the Catholic and Protestant side, but I don't think a lot of people actually understand what they're hating on, mm -hmm. if you know what I mean. I which, do, yeah. It's, which is weird, but when you're then getting, going shadowing someone, shooting guns, then when did you end up bang involved? What age? I was just turned 18. Still so, a fucking boy, Seamus, man. Uh, Still a know, kid. I know. And I had to keep trying because it was knocked back three or four times. Why? Uh... I think the guy in particular was going, there's an education in you. You could be a history teacher. Mm -hmm. You could do so much. He goes, I want to be a soldier. And um, he says, sure, going to, it was this particular guy who was stopping me. He was a recruiting officer who knew me and my family. He said, your dad's dead. Look after your mom. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And But I kept going back. So he was trying to protect you basically? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. as a young naive kid probably your dad in your mind as well you feel as if you're doing the right thing for the right reasons Yeah, which is understandable as well that mm -hmm. people can understand like when you start to deal with a history lesson for people to understand what went on why it went on and why people are fighting for a certain cause like, this is what it's all about to so try and educate people and um, when you're 18 then and just you've caught it in your mind that you want to be in the IRA you want to mm -hmm. fight for a cause and, and try and protect the people that you love like yeah. When, like, how hard is it as well if you've got friends 16, 17 who join and seen them getting killed? Was there ever a moment where they think, okay, this maybe get a bit too much? I could lose my life at a young kid, or was mm -hmm. that making you even more angry to then protect the people that you love by joining the IRA? Well, coincidentally, the first night I joined the FEMA in May 1972, I was out on one of those patrols and basically was um, at the top on the Glen Road, and this guy, or this car came down the Glen Road and I remember it was a yellow car as yellow as your t-shirt <laughs> <laughs> stuck out you know and here's me bloody a yellow yeah. car and grey West Belfast and I remember the yellow car looking at it and it was just from me to you and the back window was down and there was a guy with black greasy hair but he was carrying a machine sub machine gun <laughs> and um, he opened fire and a big lick of yellow flash hit me there and um, I pissed myself. And uh, I run, all, all I heard was, da, 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 But it was like point blank range he was firing, but he was firing at another guy and me, there was two of us. And um, I was hit there and there, and I, I jumped over uh, two fences and uh, I busted through the back door and they were all watching a Western, John Wayne, <laughs> and uh, him horn the kids. And I said, I'm, I, I, I've been shot. I'm only 15, I'm shot. And she says, they had the, the TV up loud, they didn't hear the shoot, they didn't hear it. There were three words up. And I says, I've been shot. And uh, she turned the TV off and she says, what happened? Here's me, some car, some man in the car shot me. And um, so anyway, the RA guy came out, he came look at me and um, he said, I'll take him, come on you and me. And uh, he bandaged me up, stripped me and bandaged me up and, and he had tweezers and took the lead out of my hand. And um, I was bleeding like, so uh, he bandaged me up and he says, that's your baptism of fire. I remember him saying that. I was only 15. And uh, he says, I take it you, you, you want to resign, do you? Your first night? It was May 72. Here's me, no. Here it is. <laughs> right. I says, what about the other guy? He says, we're going to get him now. Come on. I remember he went in and he, this guy was propped up against the wall. 
with his chin on his chest and a sea of you know, deep red blood all around him, you know, all moving slowly along the kitchen floor, you know, getting wider. And I says, is he dead? And he says, hey. And uh, he just he just woke up and and he says to me, what happened there? Here's me, some guy in a, a yellow car, open fire. He says, I didn't see that happening. I didn't see that. But he, he was badly injured, like, he was worse than me. But dad, they got him down south. Yeah, 15 man shot, like, so see when you join the IRA, like, what's the, what do you do then when you join so the So you IRA? have to, once you, you go through three security lectures, and there was three of us, and at this particular, these three meetings, and, um, uh, well, we're basically going to explain it in more detail. Now, this is not the FENA. This is not the FENA. This is, um, this is active service. But there again, you can join intelligence or you can join administration, known as the auxiliary IRA, which is like a, they would like police the area because the RUC were never accepted. So they would police the area against common criminals and things like that. So you could join the auxiliary IRA administration or you could join the intelligence department. And or you, you then the, the most lethal one would be the active service. So I chose active service. But I remember the intelligence guy saying to me, why do you not want to join intelligence for? Is there something wrong with us? I said, no, there's nothing wrong with you. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with you. It's just I don't think I'm cut out for that. So he was trying to recruit me into the intelligence department of the IRA. And um, I was just thought, no, I think the active service would be where I, where I belong because I see myself as a soldier. And I did. And um, so there's no point joining an army to push a pen. That's, that was my own attitude. But other guys did join the intelligence because it wasn't, they, did, they, weren't, they weren't prepared to pick up the gun. Safer. It's safer. Yeah, and they felt they were playing, playing their part. And it's true. Everyone has their own rule to play. So I just felt I, I, I could do this. And uh, he says, well, it means killing people. That's what it means. If you join active service, that's what it means. You're going to inflict pain and you're going to have to endure it. And um, you'll probably get about a six months life, uh, lifespan. And at the end of that six months lifespan, you'll go down in the cemetery and or else you go to prison for a long time. So that was explained to us. And w w the third guy says, I don't think this is for me. He got up and walked out. <laughs> remember him saying, no, no, he got the reality check. But you can understand that as well. Do you uh, know what I mean? Like people want to play that part, then they'll join a safer seat place to say look i'm still here i'm still doing my part but i'm not willing to let give up my life like so what parts did each play the sort of intelligence what would you have to do if you were doing the intelligence intelligence would be the active service units would rely on intelligence for targets you know so the intelligence would be getting into areas and checking out barracks you know when patrols going and out um areas for commercial bombing targets going to town check it out and then they would be supplying, there's your target. And li literally, there, you no know, an intelligence file will land on your your, your table. And if you're the OC, I later became OC. But at that time, it was just joined. And yeah, there you go. There's your montage, right? And that would be your officer commanding would say, right, target today is. And that's what you, yeah. so everyone had, it was all uh, departmentalized as well. It was very, it was very well organized. Um, it was always on a need to know basis. The driver didn't know what the shooter was going to do. The driver was just told to bring, to go to the target. The shooter knew the target, but not necessarily the driver. The driver was just told to go to the target. So there was very, it was all on a need to know basis. So if you were caught, there was only limited amount of information you could give. Why is that? Because there was maybe snitches in? Yeah. Informers. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And nobody, nobody trusted Nobody trusted anybody, mm -hmm. which is the right thing to do. So it was all need to know basis. And if you're arrested, um, then the gear had to be moved. If you were arrested, and even if you'd done three days in Castlereagh, the, the, the weapon stumps would be moved in case you broke in Castlereagh and said there's, uh, there's weapons and such and such. You know, and the Brits went to there, it's gone. They moved them. That's generally what did happen. So if you were an active member, then what did you have to do? Well, if you're an active member, um, uh, I would have been um, involved in shooting attacks uh, on the British Army, RUC, and also involved in commercial bombing, things like that. That's that's the type of thing you would have to do if you're in active service, you know. So um, 
Um, so uh, the other two, we decided to go ahead. One pulled out, and we, so you went through three security lectures, and then we had already been trained. Two of us had already come through FINA. We already knew weapons training. You know, we had already been to the train camp. Um, and I had to dismantle the likes of the the Armalite AR one eighty and AR fifteen. Jungle Garan M1 Carbine, Walter P38, Walter P32. We had a fair knowledge over those three or four years, you know. So you, you had already, you're already halfway there. The only thing they wouldn't let you do when you're in the FENA is actually open fire, you know. So there was no no longer shadowing when you came 18. You were now the gunman. What was it like getting sent out in your first mission? Uh, well, I always carried this cross and it was. It was my dad. It was my that that head. It was metal clad cross. I was caught with it, but I always carry that. I always felt it'll protect me. And um, I remember some of the lads laughing. Just like, are you, what are you? You you like a, a Christian, evangelical Christian? And I just felt no. I just felt protected. You know, because I believed in God and I believed in spiritual forces. But I didn't think God was going to sort of say it's okay to kill people. Uh, I, I probably me and him probably disagreed on that. But I would always like to thank Jesus. You probably understand, don't you? How hard is that for an Irish man to be killing another Irish man just because of certain beliefs? And that's the tragedy of it. I think it diminishes everyone. I think it diminishes the human being. You know? But um, you have to always stay within the military context because we all thought, we all said that, all, the, all our unit, well, the ones who were the active service people, like myself, we always felt... Um, do you think there's a life after 30? We all said no. We'll not be around. We'll do this. We'll free our people. But we'll, we'll never really have a normal life. And as a matter of fact, we're, we don't really deserve it. That's how I felt at times, you know. It's hard to, it's a, it's a, probably a subject's never really been touched on ever, you know. You know, when you, you look at um, people losing their lives, people taking life, and the whole diminishing effect of it, you know, drains you. And drains you from, actually drains the humanity out of you. So you become this um, hardened, cold, cold-hearted, cold um, steel-willed soldier. You drain out all emotion. You have to. If you're going to survive, if you're going to get through this, and you always must work on a military context. A guy told me that. Do you think it kills your soul? Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. I think it does. If I'm brutally honest, there's no gl glory in it. There's no, there's no flurry speeches here. But once I'm inside the military context, I always, always, even today, I am a soldier. And some people would say to me, why do you keep saying that? You keep repeating yourself quite a lot. You keep saying you're a soldier. They're civilians, they don't understand. I have to stay within that military context. And one guy said to me, see if we move out of that, then you may as well go and hang yourself. Because what was it what was it all about? One Irish man killing another one or you know, whatever. Mm. In that war. You know, so you always have to stay within the context of it was a war, you know. And I've, uh, I would watch, I, I, I study military history. You know, soldiers who come back from Afghanistan, Iraq, um, First World War, Second World War, Vietnam War, and they all have that sort of um, connection where, you know, they always have to always, you know, help for heroes, for example. Um, that's, that's the military context again. You know, they've been injured, badly injured, psychological injuries physical injuries, but they still have that comradeship, that brotherhood with themselves, not with their wives or their families, but with, the, with their brothers in arms. And um, I sort of, I would understand that. I would have an affinity to that, you know. It doesn't matter if you're right or wrong or, oh, the Afghans or the IRA were all wrong. No, I'm just talking if, if it's possible to be impartial and talk about soldiering in general and governments who send soldiers to war, you, you know, that um, there's always that human cost to pay and that everybody sort of understands it, you know? Yeah, is that why you keep that in that very small box, that way of thinking? Because when you actually come out that and look at the bigger picture, you, you'll start to feel the pain? Yeah, it's possible, yeah. It's it's a buffer. 
-hmm. it does cushion it it cushions the pain mm -hmm. you know yeah. and uh there's no no glory in it there's no um let's sing a song about this or i don't feel anyone should give me a pat on the back i don't really want you to pat me on the back mm -hmm. <laughs> don't feel that way what what age did you go to prison because you got 14 years i got 14 years yeah mm -hmm. i was um I actually ended up as a officer commanding of f company and um uh, I worked in conjunction with uh, a good friend of mine called uh, Brent O'Callaghan, and he was the battalion double O. A double O was an uh, operations officer, and um, he uh, he was probably one of my early mentors. He's only about a couple of years older than me, but he was married with two children. And uh, I remember having this conversation with him. Uh, we came out of one of the battalion call houses this day. He was battalion double O operations officer i was oc of a company of uh, 14 men and four women there's 18 of them i was in command of them and um uh, he remember him saying to me you know this war um uh, uh, this war could go on for another 10 years this looks like it's going to be a long war it's not going to be over soon and he says and we're just going to be expendable do you realize that and here's me what do you mean he says like we'll just you're, you're either going to get killed here do you sense that? Here's me, yeah, I do. Or you're going to prison, but it could be the other way around. We were best friends. You could, I could get killed or go to prison, but one way or the other, we're expendable and we will be replaced and the war will continue and we'll be forgotten about. We're just a little cog in a big wheel. So we think we're important, but we're not really. And I always thought, you know, I always remember that, but he was executed, he was shot dead uh, in April, 1977, April the 23rd, 1977 by undercover soldiers. And um, I was in the crumb at the time. And uh, I cried my eyes out for him in the crumb. I had to get out of the cell, went down into the ablutions, the toilet area, and cried like a baby. And I'd never cried like that since my dad died in 67. And um, I always remember him saying, we're gonna be, you know, I always felt guilty about that, that he lived, or sorry, I, I, I lived and he died. Why? Because um, he was married with two kids. I was single. And I remember, remember calling to the house and always looking at his two kids, Paul and Bren, and they were, they were toddlers, they were like two. And I'm going, how are they going to survive without him? You know? And then his wife came up to see me in the crumb, crumb and road jail. She says, what am I going to do, Seamus and I? Here's me, I'll pray for you. That's all I could say. I was just so heartbroken. And that, that was the, um, the horrors of war, if you know what I mean. The destruction it causes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when you got your 14, what did you get your 14 stretch for? Um, we were, the intelligence had said that there was a UDR soldier on the bridge at Finnegan and he goes to the, the local, uh, it was an auto light factory, car factory, but he, uh, on uniform, he's, he's, he's stopping vehicles on the bridge at Finnegan and he's, I knew about that and then also got his name, registration number and things like that. And I was in command of the operation. So, um, I was getting tired by the end of that stage. I was getting tired. How old were you? Um, I was just going 20. So five years of just educating, misery, pain, learning mm -hmm. to try and be stone cold and yeah. you not know, have any feelings or emotions. That even to be tired at the age of 20s, mm -hmm. it's kind of sad. Yeah. And I was actually saying, I had actually said, I had actually been under the bridge the first time and the battalion officer said, He'll be coming under the bridge to go to the autolite and it'll be eight o'clock be under the bridge and um make sure he's dead and um here's me he's armed i'm armed somebody's going to be dead there the udr or oh, they were always armed here's me and if he's carrying civilians i'm not shooting civilians no and he says look no it is just get on with it get it behind you and then with an r1 for you after that here's me i hope i get shot that's how I felt. I hope I get killed. Or I hope I get arrested. I'm tired. And then in between time, my mum was getting suspicious. And the door was getting kicked in. Three o'clock in the morning. I was getting, I was doing three days in Castle Ray. Special branch were always raiding the house. And I went, I don't think I can keep this mayhem going for much longer. And I wanted out and couldn't. Didn't know how to get out of it. And um, 
and I was never going to leave because I'd given oath. But I was just tired, fatigued, and uh, back at the, back down on the twentieth of January, same place, and um, I gave it an extra five minutes deliberately. I shouldn't have. I knew I shouldn't have. He didn't show up, and I gave it an extra five minutes, and the guys were going, "What's this? Should we not be leaving here?" Yeah, I gave him a couple of minutes. Here's why I got caught, and um, deep down in my subconscious, so I just said, "I don't really want to come back down here again." So I gave it that extra few minutes, and they arrived. Or you see, they opened fire and fought, and the driver I was in charge. And he says, "What'll I do?" I says, "Crash through the checkpoint, just ram it." And we did. We rammed in it, and got away. Way up the Anderson's Town Road, but a mile away, and an armored vehicle rammed us. An armored vehicle, or you say armored vehicle, crashed and was crashed in the side of a St. Agnes's Chapel. The door flew off. Once the door, once the side door flew off, I ran out. The door just actually fell off the van. I run up the side of the church. They, them two were caught, but I had a, a wobbly forty-five, a big, big gun, and I uh, dropped it and ran up the side of the church. But uh, are you see man with a rifle ran after me and he shouted, "Hold the right fire!" And I stopped and I says, "I'm going to run on, just to help it." And he stopped. And he went down one knee. He knew I was going to run on. He says, "Go on, go on, go on, go." On. And I just nah. He says, "Get your hands up." Let's march back to the van. They threw me in the bag of van, and the first thing I looked at was the Anderson's Town Road, and I'm going, I'll never see you again for a long time. I remember saying that, and I went, I'm glad. And the minute I said, I'm glad, he put his, the RUC man put his jackboot right on my neck and pushed it down on the back of, the, back of my neck. Here's me, I'm glad. Oh, before you got your 14 seam, you're in the IRA. How paranoid can you be? Because I'd imagine your life's in danger 24 7. Like did you, were you ever, did you ever sleep or were you always on edge or were you always on working 24 7 like do you get days off like how does it work like how well, yeah. has it been a soldier then like the paranoia and life in danger going to prison to then try and keep yourself alive to then how do you switch off like when you're in that uh, that's the problem there's no switching off james never no days off no and that's why it becomes so it grinds you down you know, from a psychological point of view, mm. there's just a whole grind, grinding down where you don't get R and R. I used to think, geez, the British Army won't do four months tour of duty, then they go home mm -hmm. to England. We don't, we, we weren't going home. You know, this was just constant. Another regiment came in. I had a deal with the uh, 45 Marine Commando. So they would come into the, the bar and their intelligence officer, who was known as Jeff, he would say, Hi, are you, Seamus? <sighs> Not too bad. So, um, How's the provisional IRA unit going? Everybody happy? Uh-huh. Sure. You know, that's the way they were talking. But then he brings another regiment in. It was the Queen's Own. And his nickname, the intelligence officer, we called him Jasper. So he comes in and Jeff from the 45 Marine Commando says to Jasper from the new regiment coming in, four months to duty, Jasper, this is Seamus. He's OCF F Company, 1st Battalion, Belfast Brigade. They call themselves Ogley Naharan, which is provisional IRA. And Jasper says to me, how are you, Seamus? Maybe we'll meet on the streets, yeah? Yeah, here's me, yeah, you never know, you could be lucky. <laughs> this was in a pub? Yeah. Was there ever, could you relax in a pub though? Why did they not just put one in your head? Like, could they not do that? Was that not? No. So they couldn't just walk up and pull the trigger that had to be somebody out in a mission? Like, when he was wanting you to run, yeah, that's okay to that's kill, all. kill you. So he yeah. was wanting to do that so he could kill yes, you? Yes, he could shoot if I ran on. So if you had a yeah. bullet in the back of the head, they would... It would go under review and he yes. would potentially be out of court or was it just so run by the British that they're getting away with killing innocent people, if you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Could he have just shot you if you were standing looking at him and killed you? In the bar? No, 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 he wouldn't have done that. Before you went to prison? When yes. The, when the chat, when the, you got chased and you were thinking about running, but he got down on one knee waiting for you to run. See if he'd just killed you, if you never ran, would that have been investigated? Yes. Or would it have just been a case of, nah, he was trying to escape? I think I think they needed some type of you know a semblance of an excuse. Yeah, you know, I mean, you just shot him. Well, he, I, I shot at a, a halt order, but he just ran on, shot him dead. And he just said, "Oh well, he deserved that." You know, you know, you had to give a bit of a, a yeah, reason. So it wasn't people knew you were in the IRA, but they couldn't just walk up and kill no, you. No, no. But I remember getting stopped one time. There was two of us. We we're both IRA. We we're transporting a weapon, and uh, when we got there, we we left the weapon. But on the way back, we were stopped by the Marines. Mm -hmm. And your man says, "You are both F Company, Provisional IRA. I says, that's what you say. Yeah, but we had just left the weapon off. Searched the vehicle, it was empty. And he says, do you know what it is, boys? 
see the see all this kid gloves? He says, what the government should be doing is take the kid gloves off. It means I can shoot the two of you dead now and we'll get it all over with so I can return to England. So they were they were held back to a certain degree. Yes, you know, they weren't they weren't allowed to run right. Who had the most rifles? The British or the Irish? Who had the, the most? The British had, had more firepower yeah. up, up until 19, the good old year of 1987. Mm -hmm. But we can come to that later. Yeah, we'll come to that. So you get a 14 stretch. So what is it you were actually charged with? Charged with uh, conspiracy and murder, a member of the security forces and membership of the provisional IRA. And you get sent to Long Cash? Well, we done, I spent time in, I'd done five days in Castlereagh mm -hmm. and I was beat. We were taught, we were told active service, if you're caught on active service, uh, red handed, um, they'll, not, they'll not beat you. So I wasn't expecting to get beat in Castlereagh. So when the beating started, I was going, Jesus, I got that wrong. And Buckingham Agents were telling me, you don't get beat. Your mom was kicking me in the balls, slapping me, punching. I was going, Jesus. I actually felt like saying, my recruiting officer told me that if I'm caught red handed, you're not allowed to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Try to get you a free pass, not to get beat. Oh, a free pass. Yeah. That's right. So that's when the, the madness really started because in your book, it's quite dark at what happened in um, the H block. Like there was, so you get five days beaten. Did, in that five days, did you ever try and get anybody coming forward to try and make you turn queens or make you go against no, your... No. Never? No. They just threatened me to, they, they would shoot me and leave me on the Shangle Road one time during that five days, but they weren't asking to recruit, no. Mm -hmm. So when did you go to the H block after the five days? I, I went to Crum, the Crumlin Road, and then I went, uh, went there in January, yes, uh, February. Done five, I got caught in January the 20th, 1977, and then February went to the Crumlin Road Jail, Sea Wing. And then in June in 77, moved to the H blocks, and that's when I first met uh, Bobby Sands and Kevin Lynch and Tom McElwee. They all later died on the hunger strike. There's water there as well. Yeah. Um, so what was that experience going into the H blocks for the first time? Did you know about it before you get sent there? Um, we were just told very little. We are just told that um, they're building eight concrete H blocks at a million pound a piece, but we don't know why they're, they're doing that. Um, but didn't realize it was part of an overall military strategy. You know, ostracization, normalization, criminalization. We weren't really taught any of that. We were just said, um, we were just told that they think they're going to try to make you wear a uniform. That said, it was quite basic. And um, uh, I don't, but we'll just resist. Just say no. <laughs> so that's all we were taught. We were only told that, uh, going to try and put you under a uniform, just say no. Okay. And it was so far up the road anyway, we weren't really thinking about it. You know, I had a few months left in the crumb. And well, February, March, April, May, and then June went to the, 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 the H blocks. We're still on remand. Uh, June, July, August, September, then on October, 5th of October, got sentenced, refused to recognize the court. And Judge Bombington um, gave me 14 years imprisonment for that. And then sent to the, 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 the blocks then as a sentence prisoner. So as a sentence prisoner, October the 5th, 77, I walked into the land stand. And that's when the whole nightmare started. Because when we come down, I seen the blue tiles flapping in the wind in uh, H5. I was A-wing. Sam Miller would have been in that that wing. And the, the, I was wondering why they were putting all the blue tiles out. They're all flapping in the wind. What's that? What's, what are they, what, what's all that about? And they were drying their tiles, but I, I didn't know. we just seen blue tiles. And then went into the circle, and there was a, a white shirt called Mr. McCarkey. And he says, welcome to H block five. And he says, right, boys. There was three of us, the two guys, myself and the other two guys who were caught with me at that time. And uh, we just said, we said, um, wear the uniform and go to work and call me sir. And I said, no, <laughs> I'm not calling you sir. And uh, so you gotta remember, we all seen ourselves as soldiers, regardless of propaganda. Propaganda meant nothing to us, the media, BBC really Ulster. What they said, we don't really, we disregard all them. It's what we thought of ourselves. It's the way we carried ourselves. It was our vision of life, not theirs. So we were fighting a war. We were soldiers, but we had already come through from Fina at 15. We are five years into this. And um, for him to say, right now, start calling me sir, and now you're a common criminal, and uh, wear the uniform, and you're going to do prison work, I went, no. Oh, no? Did you say no, Kearney? I said, yeah. And the screw had a button. I, I wasn't. That's the first time I started seeing violence from prison officers. 
he didn't really stay out in the crumb at all that I seen. I didn't see any of that. But he drew his baton. It seemed to be like a real aggressive attitude they had. And McGaki pushed him back and said, No, but you don't be using that baton on him. Don't touch that prisoner. He says he's only human, he can be broken. And um he says, You gonna wear this uniform? No. Strip. I take everything off and put it in a brown bag. So it was completely naked, underwear and everything. And then I had to go in and see the governor. The governor was called Mr. Irwin. We called him Hurry Feet because he wore desert boots. <laughs> so they were like Hurry Boots. So we called him Hurry Feet. Everybody had a nickname. We had we ended up with nicknames. Prison officers ended up with nicknames. But Hurry Feet or Mr. Irwin says, uh, Kearney, do you know where you are? I says, uh, Long Cash. He says, No, you're in the HMP, me as cellular. And he says, You're in the H5. It's an unconforming block. So you're an NCP. I says, right. He says, um, what do you get? What were you sentenced? They asked me 14 years. What were you doing? I says, uh, conspiracy to murder, member of the security forces, right? He says, well, there's no soldiers in here. The only soldiers of the British Army. They're attacking the perimeter of the camp. And um, so you're going to be a common criminal. And that's totally alien to my psyche. I went, but I'm not. I'm a soldier. Huh? You're a soldier? What are you a soldier of? I says, I'm a soldier of Ireland. Right? Well, there's no soldiers here. So you're a criminal. He says, so um, if you, are you prepared to wear the uniform? No. You're not prepared to go to work? No. Are you going to are you going to call Mr. McCockey, sir? No. I don't know. He says, um, well, we're going to award you. They we're very Germanic. Everything was documented. Everything was, you know, German efficiency, I used to call it. And he says, we're going to award you um, a loss of all privileges, all handicrafts. And that includes fresh air. You'll be locked in a cell 24 hours a day. You're not getting out. And you'll be naked. And you'll be put on a number one starvation diet. How long do you think you could do that? Do you think you could do 14 years like that? Here's me. Um, never really thought about it. But I'm only realizing the reality of it now because we're not being taught. We, we're not told this mm. in the crumb. It was very much ad hoc. There was no careful analysis. Mm. You know, it was just make this up as you go along, improvise. I went, uh, for, under those conditions? <laughs> <laughs> Easy. Easy. <laughs> Easy. <laughs> yeah. So he says, I'll have a go at it. <laughs> <laughs> It's yeah. fucking madness to mind in it to yeah. try and make a stand and not break that. Like, how hard is that? Like, even see when he's saying that to you, even though you're trying to be staunch and say no chance. Like, what are you? You really thinking? You thinking? Fuck! Like, this is going to be tough. I, I the only know? thing I was thinking was, I don't think I can do without that bread. Yeah. I, need, I need to have six rounds of bread. I love my food. Yeah, and I was just going, no. I don't, 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 fucking struggle. Deep down, I was saying, no, no, please, Governor, not the bread. Don't, 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 mm -hmm. don't, don't go near the starvation tent. Don't, don't be putting me on that. Mm -hmm. But I had to put the straight face on. I said, I'll have a go at that. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, ended up locked up. And when the cell door closed, that was on the 5th of October, 77, naked. So if you imagine that, James, mm -hmm. if I locked you into my garden shed, at the bottom of the, the garden, naked, locked you in that garden shed for four years and 10 days. Do you think you'd be sane at the end of it? Nah. One day, man, I've done a few weekenders in Glasgow, man. I've been insane after three days, and that was me getting fed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> With clothes and a fucking blanket. <laughs> but, but it's obviously for the mind that. I don't know, back in the day, I, I, I don't know, I watched somewhere, I think when people used to get captured, they used to drop like, water at the top of their head. Yeah. And it was only for like, a week or whatever, and it, just with a drop of water on their head, it used to drive them insane. Yeah. So being stuck in there with no food and blanket and fucking... All grey, every everything military yeah. grey. Grey blocks, grey mm -hmm. barbed wire, black crow. If you're, you know, black crows would rest on the razor wire, you would just stir it through the window at the black crows on the razor wire. And then... So one day led to another. So I was locked in a cell like that from the 5th of October, 77. Locked in, and then I got out again on the 15th of October, 1981. And that was four years and 10 days. I was kept like that. Tortured. Yeah. So see, when the days are going on, like how hard is it not to break? But did they just try and break you every single day? No, there was the days the, they would they get fed up doing it. And... 
they they were the ones that became the alcoholics, not us. They were trying so hard for four years that we, a guy next door to me, Brandon McLaren, he had former uh, Blangamon, he says, I think we've reached the stage that it's like for them, they've tried so hard to break us in the field, it's like chewing on a brick. All they're doing is breaking all their teeth, but they're not breaking the brick. We're the brick. And that's the phenomenal thing about this. You know, it's quite extraordinary. I actually surprised myself. I look back in that period and I don't actually identify that person who I was. I'm actually living to, I've, I've lived two or three lives. Mm -hmm. That was a, that, that person, I, he's a bit alien to me, that person, you know, who did that. I, I actually say to that person, Jesus, hey boy, you done well. Four years and 10 days and you didn't break. Whoa, you did, you really did take that oath of allegiance to the Irish Republic and you meant it. And that's what drove us. A common criminal wouldn't be able to do that. You need to have a belief to, 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 to sustain yourself and such those adverse conditions, if you know what I mean. Yeah, something to fight for. Yeah. And truly believe what you're fighting for yeah. is the right cause. Yes. Or else, what's the fuck's the point? What's the point? Yeah. Day in, day out. Mm -hmm. You know, summer came and then autumn and then winter came and then the following year was spring and we were still there. What was the daily routine like? Um, uh, uh, seven o'clock in the morning, uh, they would come in off night guard and start rattling. Your cell, the steel, there were green cell doors, steel. They were hitting the buttons to wake you at seven in the morning just for badness because then the night guard was leaving. So he came in at seven, bat battered you up, the cell doors. You weren't going anywhere. And then they'd come around to breakfast and about eight, usually porridge or cornflakes. The criminal orderlies would hand them into you with the, on a trolley and you weren't leaving your cell. And um, I then come back and got the dishes. So then 12 o'clock, you got your. A razor blade meat and a couple of chips just enough to keep you alive you know and then half 12 to half half 12 to two they went on their lock up they went on their liquid lunch to the social club inside the camp this is a few a huge camp by the way this is a vast camp there's thousands in it and um so they come back at two do a head count and then you get up because they're back and you start walking up and down the cell up and down up and down do you ever watch Papillon? on mm -hmm. It's escapes like, uh, an island yeah but the cell up and yeah, down yeah, up yeah, and yeah. down up and down i had seen that the original i had seen steve mcqueen 73 yeah. and i started replicating what he was doing here's me steve mcqueen kept walking up and down up and down up and i started doing the same get your nose into the wall make use of every every space of the cell up and down all day and then that would be you until you're tired again and half four to half five they went on another lockup you got your tea around then which would have been maybe a pasty or some peas that was it until the next day seven o'clock battered the one waking you know and then things got it got worse um as uh as the protest continued um we were lucky uh and i was lucky because in that was october 77 the following year in the january 78 brenton Hughes uh arrived on the wing and uh he was a bit of a legend even in the camp, he was, he was the camp OC. I'd never met him, but he was in the cages. He lost his status. He had a, a row or a fraga, and he lost his status. And he was sent, lost his political status in the cages, and they sent him down into A Wing, H5. And he ended up in the next cell to me. And he was known as the Dark because he looked like a Mexican. You know, he's in, there's a photograph of him in the book there. He just looked like a foreigner. And Brendan, I don't know if many people know us, but Brendan was, was he not the one who started the hunger strike? Yes. Was he not the man behind that? Yes. So a lot of people think it was Bobby Sands, but no. it was actually Brendan, is that correct? Yeah. That's Brendan Cues was already. Yeah, I read that in, I read that in your book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It it doesn't get the recognition that he deserves. Why is that? I think he became disillusioned in one later life. Mm -hmm. And he fell out with the Republican movement. And that's what happened. And they you know act, uh, he became disillusioned, and I've seen that happen in every war. You know, you reminded me of a guy called Ara Hayes in Clint Eastwood's film Flags of Her Fathers. He was played by Adam Beach, and Ara Hayes became disillusioned, and um, it was sad to see, you know, the, the downfall mm -hmm. of a great man, and um, he, he, he didn't he didn't become part of the group anymore but with Brendan he became disillusioned and in later life I would used to call down at his flat and he would be sitting there on his own and um, 
I would ask him um, you know, what exactly was the matter or what was the problem and he just said to me one time, it would break your heart like him, but I remember him saying to me, um, he says, I always see myself as your father and you are my children. And um, I lost ten, 10 of my children. And I, I remember grabbing his coat. I says, that's exactly how we felt. We were your children. He says, do you see the pressure that's under 300 men doing that? Doing that in me? Tugging at my coat? Do you see the pressure? He says, yeah. He says, that's a lot of responsibility, she was. And I let 10 of, I let 10 of my children die. You know? Yeah, do you think that's what broke them then? Yeah. Uh, along with everything else that went in the daily routine. So when you've done the protest, how many people were involved in the protest for change in the H blocks? Uh, 340. So, and how many people were involved in? And it was over 800. So they, they, they'd worked their way through a lot of them, but there was a hard cadre left. <coughs> I was one of them, I'm proud to say, that wouldn't give in. But yes, they were breaking people. And it's Every, can you understand yes, that as well, though? Of course. If you, if they, someone is broken with the, would you distance yourself from them as you feel as if they were failing no. for what you were standing for? Or could no. you see in there that, okay, I understand, maybe you've got family outside, maybe you want to visit that. Was that, you weren't just pushed aside that you were you broke from command or that everybody was standing together? Because if everybody stands together, then I believe you can create change. Yes. If everybody breaks, then there's no change because... The H blocks is what changed the game. Like what they done in that hunger strike is what changed. Like uh, do you believe that yourself? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Like, so you, you, I'd like to ask you a question you know, yeah. from an outsider. Yeah. I have questions. You have questions. Everybody's mm -hmm. got questions. But what's happened today? Mm -hmm. You think started back then? I think for the H blocks, I think with the hunger strike, and Bobby Sands, and the over a hundred thousand people at his funeral. I think what happened in there is to understand that the Irish couldn't be broken, and that's when as time went on then obviously the peace agreement the good friday agreement but i think then is what people know is what was going on i think that's what gave it the attention that it probably needed to try for people to come and try and create change that like, i don't know all the polit political sides of it i'm not irish so but just from reading the books and watching the films you see well wait a minute that's what i know yeah. island or as bobby stands and going through the hunger strike and the change that then created for the mass attention to then yeah. for Ireland being at peace just now that like, I believe it all started in the H-Box listen there's always stepping stones to get to yeah, certain yeah, levels yeah. but I think that was the, the main catalyst mm -hmm. where people realised that these men ain't breaking yeah. and are going to keep standing and keep fighting until something is resolved Yeah, and I believe that's for my opinion is where it started yeah there was also um, we were special prisoners as well you know they said we were criminals but you know, we had come through special courts special one jury you know, there was, there was no juries. It was just a judge delivering uh, the verdict on us and they were now in special prisons. So it's not a case where, oh, sure, you went through due process, but didn't. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, they had set up, basically, batter, batter him, force him to sign a statement and bring him in front of a, a, a judge and the judge will decide. And it was just rubber stamp. So it was like a conveyor belt, mm -hmm. if you know what I mean. Yeah, and that was known as criminalization. So they wanted to criminalize the struggle to say these aren't soldiers, these are criminals. And people like myself, the 300 of us says, no, we're not. So your protest, what was your pro protest to stand for? You didn't want to wear a uniform. Yeah. You wanted to be, it was basically to known as the five demands. And parcel. So what was the five demands? Yeah, you had the, the right not to wear a prison uniform mm -hmm. and then the, the right not to do prison work. Um, partial awake uh, restoration of loss remission and then free association, interwing association, which they wouldn't allow, you know, with their other comrades, the far wings. So it's free association, they call that, we call that, and then the restoration of loss remission. I lost four years on remission. So I was wanting that four back at the end of the protest. Did you ever get a visit while you were doing the, the first protest? The first year, not, first year we didn't take a pro visit, no. But it was the dark, Brenton Hughes decided to um, start he says, with three options here, and that was in February 78 when he arrived. He says, how long have you been here? Here's me from last October. Here's Jesus. Are you okay? Can you survive that? Here's me. So far, so good. Yeah, I'm trying. I'll just take it. You know, that old saying, one day at a time, sweet Jesus. <laughs> 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 one day at a time, sweet uh -huh. Jesus, you know. Uh -huh. So he says, Jesus, that's, that's quite amazing. You know, so um, little did I know it was going to actually end up for four years like that. But uh, so he says, well, three options. One, to um, stay where we are, remain status quo, mm -hmm. stay on a, a, a blanket protest, refusing to wear the uniform, 
doesn't look like we're going to go anywhere here. Option two would be to uh, go into the system and work in behind enemy lines, as he called it, burn the workshops, go go hand to hand fighting with the, the screws and uh, and the loyalists, cause cr cause the whole camp and you know turn it into a fucking fireball, burn the place down, or three, um, a form. And this was his words. He was the architect of this. Uh, uh, and a watch protest that was unheard of. Nobody knew what that was. He pioneered that. Brenton Hughes. And uh, he says, what, what would that entail? Because I was an Excel to him. He says, well, I was thinking where well, you, you refuse to wash and you're going to have to start taking visits because there, you mean the communications out here to find out what's, you know, people need to know what's going on in here, you know? So you need to start taking visits to set up a communication system with the outside world. And then, of course, um, uh, just try to highlight the plight of these of the of the blanket men uh, by refusing to wash. And we were already getting harassed anyway on the way out to the ablutions, so the toilet areas. But he says we stop all that and uh, we exploit it. We exploit the fact that they're in, in used in, you know, and they're involved in petty harassment. The minute we leave the cells, we'll exploit that by racking all around us, and that'll increase morale. And it did. So that happened in March. We. I went to the vote, and none of the lads were prepared to wear the uniform. The vote came back. We are not prepared to use wear a criminal uniform. We are not prepared even to go into the workshops. So he was. He says they're going for the the option of uh, escalating the protest, and that happened in March 1978. And Brenton Hughes was uh, behind that. Bobby Sands became his PRO, so it was actually Brenton Hughes to command. He came down to command in around February 78. And he was ROC right through the, all of 78, all of 79, all of 80, right up until the 27th of October 1980. So fundamentally, he was the leader of the Blanket Man, Brendan Hughes. And how, how easier is that when you've got somebody so solid and who seems quite intelligent to be then putting these things together to then planning, like, is the art of war in it? Like, oh. It seemed to be bang on. Like, to, to try and come up with strategies like a chess game yeah that's like, exactly right so why is his name not as out there as Bobby Sands um he didn't die the main reason yeah if he had died on the first hunger strike he led the first hunger strike yeah. on the 27th of October 1980 but um in all honesty and if we're going to be open and frank about it and I always like to call a spade a spade I'm not going to if you ask me a question I'll try and give you the a comprehensive answer, as truthful as it can, without embarrassing people. But um, I think uh, he was too compassionate. We loved him, and he loved us. It was a father-children relationship, but he took things very personal. And maybe, he, he actually said that to me one time, after we got out, years later. He says, I took it personal. He says, I know you did. He says, uh, I wasn't... I wasn't cold hearted and clinical when it came to that hunger strike, you know? And, um, but he, uh, he didn't tell me the full story anyway. But what I've heard and what I've tried to piece together was he tried to save Sean McKenna's life. Who's he? He was one of the hunger strikers, he was one of the seven. And towards the end, it ended, it started on the 27th of October, 1980, and it ended on the 18th of December, 1980. One of the reasons why it ended was, among other things, you know, I'm not full authority on what happened because the dark wouldn't tell me the full. He says, "Are oh, you read it in the history books?" But it was such a complex issue where he, Sean McKenna, had asked him, "I don't want to die." Did Sean mean that? I don't know, but he was on a hunger strike for fifty odd days. So lots of things can happen to the body and the mind. Mm -hmm. People can say things, then retract them, but. He said to Sean, you won't have to. I'll not let you die. He promised Sean he wouldn't let him die. Some people thought, well, he should have just let Sean McKenna die. But it wasn't in his nature. Yeah, And people can't make that call if they're not there as well. If you mm -hmm. say it's like a father and son relationship, if that's one of your sons saying he doesn't want to die, whether he's hallucinating or whatever's going through his mind, then it's not anybody's call except for the man who's there who's then started the hunger strike. So he's got to live with that. Yes. But then that, then becomes is he killing one of his own yeah if he started the hunger strike and somebody's saying i don't want to die but if he lets him die then he's got to take full responsibility of that action like, yes so there was two hunger strikes the yeah. first one 
how uh, what was the planning behind the first hunger strike what are you thinking in there you're thinking that like, people are willing to give their life like that is there's no even any words to describe that somebody willing to give up their life for a cause to try and create change like that is mm. that, uh, again I, I never get stuck for words but to put that into words i don't think i would justify it like to then lay down your willing to people with your families outside they've came to a, a, an agreement that we're going to have to die here to try and create change like to give up your life that's like, unbelievable like, yeah no matter what because i've spoke to people on the other side mm -hmm. um and even they respect that yeah they respect that like and and i never thought i would hear that from someone else's mouth from the other side, the other side. They, but they did say look i respect that that like, was on it's unimaginable what they actually went through but mm. what was that agreement then to them everybody was sitting to say look we're going to go and go on hunger strike here did they the first one did they think that they were going to live up the life or did they actually think maybe this will give them a shock that maybe things can change like yeah so the answer to that hmm. i'm going to explain for the first time um the reason why i'm saying the first time is because um my son he, he actually was he's he was doing this subject a few years ago gcse level and he it said to me dad we're doing the hunger strikes in the blanket protest and my strong history teacher asked a very intelligent question to the class she says, can anyone explain, now we're dealing with this subject, can anyone explain why so many men died in Long Cash or the Maze Prison, whatever your take on it, in the summer of 1981, why so many men died? And um, I said, well, Thomas, I educated you. I told you the real story, even though it's not down in the history books. He says, I know, I know you did. And I said, so what, what was the answer? She says, dad, one guy put up his hand and said, Miss, the reason why so many men died in the summer of 1981 is because of uh, the five demands. Another guy said, Miss, the reason why so many men died is because of political status. And I said, what do you say? He says, I put my hand up. And I says, Miss, the reason why so many men died in the summer of 1981 in Long Cash is because one brother laid down his life for another. And Miss Strong said, but Thomas, that's not in the, the GCSE curriculum. He says, I know, Miss, it hasn't been written down by the men who were there yet. It hasn't been written down yet by the men who were there. And... He planted a seed, obviously, because she held him back at the end of the class. He says, Thomas, could you stay behind? And uh, she says, Thomas, that was such a profound and intelligent statement you just come off with her. Is that actually what happened? Yeah. Miss, it is. Technically, miss, those answers are not wrong. You know, they died for five demands, political status. But you asked the question, why so many men died in the summer of 1981? That's the answer. One brother let down his life for another. They were all intricately linked. Like lemmings going off the side of a cliff. And she says, can I ask you who your source is? He says, no, miss, I know these things and walked out of the class. I says, Thomas, why did you not tell it was your dad? Dad, she doesn't deserve to know about you. So see when you, the hunger strike then begin to start, like what's going through your mind when you've got men there who's come up with an agreement to then lay down their life? Like, what is the comrades in there thinking? Right, so yeah, the hunger strike is intricately linked to the blanket protest. Mm -hmm. People just talk about the blanket protest, but we're, you have to deal with the five-year protest, mm -hmm. which culminated in the blanket protest. So one's intricately linked to the other. Without the blanket protest, that the hunger strike, to that extent, that gravity wouldn't have happened. Mm -hmm. You have to remember that. So that brotherhood was forged over a long period of time, four years, from 76 to, uh, to 1980. And we became like, we were brothers. We weren't blood brothers, you know, biologically, but we became as brothers through adversity, through the beatings, through starvation, through that, you know, that commonality. And um, so it's hard to describe it. It's, uh, some people describe the blanket protest as a, an out-of-body experience or a metaphysical experience. It's all that. It, um, whatever it was, it was, it was beautiful. Like that, that bond of no manhood, that brotherhood, which was forged throughout 77, 78, 79, and 80. By 80, we were of the opinion we'd rather be dead now because we're not going to get criminalized. We weren't thinking like that in 76 or 77. You know, maybe in active service, you're going to get killed. But this year, it was in prison. We were thinking R&R &R in prison. We've made it across the line. We didn't get killed. We're going to put our feet up. But it wasn't until July 78 when Brent Hughes explained exactly what was happening, 
everyone got up to the, we were told to get up to the door. The statement was read out and it was basically explained to us, this is part of a policy of the British trying to crush the IRA. And it's known as a three-pronged military strategy uh, of normalization, criminalization, Australization. Australization was going to be where the British Army go back into a supportive role and the police are pushed into the front line, um, creating a law and order issue, not a war. Um, the cages are in term it all ends, this cages system ends, and then these blocks are built um, to deal with these criminals and these gangsters. And criminalization was to be us no longer soldiers after the 1st of March 1976. After that date, you are now common criminals and you will be treated as criminals. And then to tell the, the international community, the world out there, we've resolved this. It was a law and order issue. It's nothing to do about freedom or human rights. And it's been resolved. We have crushed the IRA. The breakers yard, the battlefield was to be the hate blocks. And that's where it was going to be fought. We weren't aware of that. We were arriving on a battlefield, not knowing the tactics. So it wasn't, for me personally, it wasn't until July 78, um, where we were actually told by the dark, this is it. And he was intelligent and he formulated a strategy and that we will always be forever grateful to him for that. And we will always have that bond with him. You know, I couldn't speak highly of him, any more highly than I can. I just, mm -hmm. uh, I just thought we needed that injection of professionalism. And he was a proper general with strategies on the way forward. And he got us into a, a, a battle group and he says, right, this is how the troops are going to be run. I'm going to lead them from the front. And this is where we're going. And I, he put everything in context. Yes, you are soldiers. But you have been caught at the front line and you have been in most campaigns. And this is his statement on July 78. You are sent to the, most soldiers are sent to the rear and set it out until the war ends. And I thought that's what we were going to do. He says, in this phase of the campaign, that's not going to happen. The Brit British war machine has now went into the camp and they're going to turn this place into a camp, uh, an Agger's yard. This is going to be the, the, the destruction of the republicanism and republican movement. It's going to be destroyed in here. Once they destroy the IRA, and scatter their support base on the outside, then they're going to broker a deal with the spineless SDLP and the moderates. That was the policy. And that's what the Brits were hell-bent on doing under Thatcher. And he says, the only people are going to stop them are you, you guys. We are actually going to make history here. We are going to the ones that are going to make the stand and save it, save the IRA. And we were going, Jesus. <laughs> and I was thinking to myself that night, what happened to my r and What happened to the my rest period were, you know, the, the rest and relaxation. And um, the, I'm back in the front line of a war again. So I, I made the decision, I'm not leaving. I know this is going to be a long drawn out struggle. This isn't the jail issue now. This is the, the war machine that I had been fighting on the outside as now I come into the camp. So I, I seen this as a, another military operation to defeat them. And we were going to use our bodies to do it because they had stripped us naked, disarmed us. But it was quite, it's never been done in Irish, it's never been seen in Irish history on such a scale. I don't even, even think it's been seen on a world scale that a prison protest turns into a battlefield. And at the heart of it is the, your, your, is, um, the future of your own nation. And I think you're right earlier on when you said about being a pivotal moment, mm -hmm. the hunger strike, the battlefield. I'm just explaining, trying to explain the, the complexities of it and how we were thinking, because we weren't really thinking like that until July 78. But after that statement, I remember Scooby Keery and Jimmy Conway. Jimmy Conway got up and shouted, Did you hear that, Scooby? And here he is. Yeah, here he is. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> <laughs> in other words, You're going to die in there. You're going to die in here. Uh, and I remember walking away from the door and my cellmate, he was called uh, Jared Derry. We called him Nana because he looked like a, the Greek singer Nana Muscuri. Black, long black hair and glasses. She was a Greek singer at the time called Nana Muscuri. So he was known as Nana. And Nana just looked at me. He says, fuck it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he says, we're, we're never getting out of here. <laughs> he says, we're, we have to be the savers of the Irish nation. I says, that's our mission, Nana. And I, I'm in the history. I'm in, I'm in the 300 Spartans at Thermopylae. Mm -hmm. You know, and he goes, you and your fucking history lessons. You know, I says, this is our moment. Come with the moment, come with the man. We're here. We were going to make history. He says, fuck it. <laughs> mm -hmm. But it's mad to, for somebody to have that belief that it was going to change history mm -hmm. and for 300 men or a few hundred men to actually believe that as well and actually stand their ground, to stand with the dirty protest, to stand with the blanket boys, to then go on the hunger strike, to then creating something where change did eventually happen. Like it was always stepping stones for things, to for somebody what they believe in and, and stood strong towards it, like you say that. Like, 
people were broken, but so many people stood tall and mm-hmm. were willing to risk their life to go, wait a minute, I genuinely believe what I'm fighting for is the right reason. Like, when you, the hunger strike started the first time, like, how was Bobby Sands as a, as a person when you started befriending him? Uh, I met him in uh, June 77, and we were still in remand because... Crum was the Crum and Roger was packed up and coming prisoners, so they moved us up to uh, H1 June 77. And, and I remember him standing there in the canteen and uh, he looked like a Rod Stewart lookalike. <laughs> the hair, yeah, uh-huh. he looked like a uh, <clears throat> feather cut, I think they called mm-hmm. it. Uh, and uh, he loved Rod Stewart. And uh, on the Branca protest, I actually gave him the words to this old heart of mine from the Atlantic Crossing album, it's a great track. Yeah. Uh, the second one by Aisley Brothers isn't bad, but that one that Rod Stewart done from the Atlantic Crossing album is I think his best. And Bobby liked that particular one. But anyway, he wanted to, that's where he got that Atlantic Crossing album, which came out about 75. So he says, anybody got the words of this old heart of mine? Here's me, I have it. I like that song. I give him the words to it. You know, but he, he loved Rod Stewart. Um, he was a good footballer. He played soccer. Didn't play Gaelic. He played soccer out in the, in the, in the yard that summer of 77. And he played the guitar. He's, he's multi-talented, like, and he, he was another guy. He wasn't of the same, he didn't carry the same gravitas as uh, Brenton Hughes, if you know what I mean. He wasn't viewed like that. At times, he could be a bit of a, a nuisance. Leave me alone, Bobby. <laughs> you know, uh, a bit like the guy next door, uh, the guy in the crowd that you would overlook. And if you asked me then that Bobby's going to be this international hero, I would say, nah, not him. Brenton Cues, yes, but no, nah, not Bobby. No, no. And yet, they say, come with the moment, come with the man. He's the guy that stepped out of the crowd. His moment didn't come in 77 or 78 or 79. It didn't even come in 1980. His moment actually came in 1981. And he stepped forward in January. Um, he, had took, he took over. He'd been there from the 27th of October. Uh, because the dark went on hunger strike for the first hunger strike and Bobby became uh, the camp uh, the black so see but um he hadn't really worked it out the the the, rel- the reliance was on the hunger strike um the first one to to break the back of the British at field for what I when I explained that they offered a deal and took it away the duplicity of them if you know what I mean they offered a deal they took it away they give us a two page document they give them in the prison hospital the seven hunger strikers a 32 page document but it was all flowery language like you know this is this may happen and a more humane prison regime may be may be uh, implemented if this protest ends but it was all maybe it was a bit like Boris Johnson and his his Brexit negotiation mm-hmm. he keeps moving the goalposts you can't nail him down and you couldn't nail Thatcher down either she, sure. was a, she was a bastard, man. She's not she, she, what she done to Scotland as well, man. She yeah. tore it apart, the bastard. And yeah, people don't forget that here. That like, I'm not for politics, but I know what my mum and dad had to go through. My granddad and grand and stuff like they proper struggled with, with what she done, and that's that's where the, you can have a bit of anger and vengeance mm-hmm. towards somebody because you know how powerful they can be, and and politicians are powerful. No matter what way you look at it, they, they can change lives, but they also destroy lives. Yeah. Because so see that that sentiment that you have. Mm-hmm. If you could just capture that for one second, because then that's when we can join forces, because we felt the exact same sentiment mm-hmm. once she started letting them men die like that. Can you understand that sentiment? Yours is so much more. Aye. Uh, effect to, yeah. to, it has so much more purpose to it mm. do you know what i mean but i know that, that what that was caused up here with a lack of jobs and poverty that went through the roof like it was and this was the 80s i was only a kid yeah do you know what i mean but i remember the effects that it did have and there was no wars here there was none of that so you've also got that added on to the thing that you're fighting for like when the first hunger strike was there like did you, was it was it seven men seven men yeah what you thinking then when it's going to day 40 day 50 did that make you stronger to what you were fighting for? Did it make you question it? Like, people are losing their life here and there's nothing changing? Well, there was always that possibility that she was going to do a brinkmanship. We thought once they get to about 53 days, she'll 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 give them it. That's what it did. We, we were convinced that's what happened. She'll not let them die. Because we were aware of international pressure, you know, from the America, the Irish-American lobby. We had a big, strong Irish-American lobby over there. And uh, we were getting, I mean, a priest was coming up and, Booster and our morale, Father Matt Wallace, he says, there was, um, last year there was 300 at the at a rally for you. Uh-huh. That's, that sounds about right. 
300 <coughs> lazy people. He says, now with the hunger strike, 10,000 have been attending Belfast City Centre. Here's me. We didn't believe it. And I says, no way. He says, I'm telling you, you've, you've rallied the people. Really? You mean 10,000 people? Let's see when I went back and told the lads. Right, lads? Because all you got from them was, was get up and give us a bit of scale. Because, you know, it was funny then because... It, you know, you've been locked up for so long, three or four years later, and somebody would shout out the door, is anyone out there? Does anyone care? What year is it? <laughs> there was a lot of banter going on in Laugh, there too. Like laughing at your own misery. Oh, wow. Yeah. You know, it was all black humour. Yeah. And um, so when I get up and I says 10,000, and somebody shouts, lie down, Kearney, will you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Stop fucking land. Uh -huh. I says, I'm not land. Far Matt Wallace was up there and he says, 10,000 people are at a march in Belfast. He says, will you lie down, you fucking idiot? Stop fucking making it up. Nobody cares about us. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, there was a lot of black humour. There was a lot of um, positivity through negativity. <laughs> it was just um, how to get through your day, you know, laughing at, every at everybody's... Uh, Mm -hmm. a misery <laughs> so when Thatcher apparently the first hunger strike he's actually yeah. thought he's had an agreement yes. and everything was resolved yes and then she took that agreement back yeah she says once the hunger strike ends the the 32 page document will be implemented but when Bobby read the 32 page document that's when Bobby's now coming of age so you can chart him back to around about 18th of December looking at him for, in, a, in a critical Given, given, looking at it, I would always give somebody a, a critical analysis, and I would go, "There's Bobby now starting to realize, Jesus, you could drive a coach and horses through that thirty-page, two-page document. That means nothing unless it's the spirit of the agreement is implemented. If the spirit of that agreement is not implemented, that means nothing, and it meant nothing. And that's when the dark realized that he had been outmaneuvered from a military point of view. Mm -hmm. He was outmaneuvered. The Brits had outmaneuvered him." And he never recovered from that. So the dark's downfall began on the 18th of December, the day the hunger strike ended, 1980. He died in February the 16th, 2008, but his downfall began on the 18th of December, uh, two, uh, 1980. Did he feel as if he lost a bit of a war uh, there? Yeah, he was outmaneuvered and he... Tactics wrong. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is, this is you know, these are human skittles. People are dying here. Mm -hmm. You know? Did he blame himself for that? Uh, he did. And once the second, he knew then there's going to be another hunger strike. He didn't want Bobby to go on it. Why? I think he, I think he, he didn't want men to die. I think, as I told you, the dark is for a general. It, we loved him, but he was a compassionate general. Maybe he wasn't too ruthless enough, but we loved him anyway. Yeah, you know, we loved him. He just wasn't ruthless enough. But that's not even. Uh, I'm not even criticizing him. The dark for to me is beyond criticism. Do people criticize him? Yeah, people criticize him. Who? People who don't know him. You know, they would give a, a throwaway line. Well, oh, he should have died in a hunger strike, or he should have let Sean McKenna die. But they they, had, they weren't there. So many people were there. So that's why you think if he had died, then he wishes part of him would have died with yes. the hunger strikers, yeah. and then it would have meant more as if he sacrificed his these lives for his own gain but again if you were there and lived it he was trying to look after everyone yeah but was he putting that across this is what can happen but obviously when you're trying to get peace and you're trying to get freedom you're trying to for the five uh, what is it five, five demands five demands for you like he'd understand the sacrifice but if you'd signed up for the ira you understood the sacrifice mm -hmm. which was worth it, and, uh, worth it and i'd imagine that was death anyway so yeah it must be hard because living that day in, day out, going through the struggle, the beatings, the lack of food, that like, mm -hmm. like no men, there's not many people who's came through that and still here to tell the tale. Like, oh, no. see, on the hunger strike, like, what was it like? How many weeks did it take to deteriorate? Or was it just after a few days or did it take a few weeks? Like, um, are we talking about the second hunger strike yeah. here? Right, so there was a, a period of, as I say, Bobby tried to try to run with the ball, try to make do what, what he got. He was given a bad hand. None to do with the dark. It's just the Brits had outmaneuvered and he had it was left the three two page document, which he said himself that you could run a horse and cart through that. It means nothing. So he started come with the moment, come with the man. This was when Bobby's greatness appears, in my estimate, in January, where he says to Hildreach, um we can we can work with this. Hildreach knows. 
he's representing Her Majesty's government. He says, oh yes, Mr. Sanson, you have been outmaneuvered. We're not implementing anything. You are going to move now into full criminality and full conformity. This was absolute humiliation. They wanted to rub our noses in it. He says, so all the five years of what you went through, self-inflicted, it's all coming to an end. You have failed, Mr. Sons. So the next sale to me was my, the Black OC called Pat McKeown. So he, the, the, he says, I need to speak to my Black OCs from three, four, and six. So Pat would have kept me up, um, updated because he was in Excel. And he went up and met Bobby and they met the respective OCs. And Bobby said the following. He says, they think Hildridge, Stanley Hildridge, the governor, and the British government think that we're going to capitulate. We're going to put up the hands and surrender like the Italians during the Second World War. But we're not Italians in the Second World War. We're not doing it. He says, we're more like the Germans. We're not surrendering. He says, we're going to show them Irish fighting strength. And one of the black pots says, Bobby, really? The logistic, I mean, is it mechanically, logistically possible to start an Irish hunger strike after this debacle? The vote maneuvers? I know. He says, there is going to be an Irish hunger strike. The first strategy was wrong. All seven men were on together. One becomes weak, the others become dependent or become responsible. The dark felt responsible for the weakest, didn't want the weakest to die. He can die, but he doesn't want, he can't allow his weakest to die. So he's, the strategy on our behalf is wrong. This time it'll not be seven men together, it'll be one man on his own. There'll be a lone paper on his own, leaving the trenches at intervals to, to go towards the enemy lines. That's how we've seen this. The lone paper will leave the trenches on his own and head towards enemy the enemy lines across no man's land. And they were, they will say, Pat says, who's going to lead that? He says, I'll lead it. I'll lead us out of the trenches on my own. And it'll be staggered every two weeks, one man, and it'll be a wave, it'll be one man on his own. So nobody's responsible. The man is responsible for his own life. Nobody else's. He'll die on his own. And um, that's what happened with Bobby. It'll start on the 1st of March. I'll lead it out. But first hand, if I can avoid this, I will. I'm going to try and recoup some of this. What's written in that 32-page document? It's rubbish, but I'm going to try to, um, from a propaganda point of view, we need to regain the initiative and win hearts and minds for our own people. The Brits aren't going to move, but we're going to look that defeat. We're going to try and turn it into some type of spiritual victory. And that's what he tried. And that's the genius of Bobby. I always thought that was fantastic, him doing that on his own. I'm going to turn this into, yeah, he, he needed he needed to change the whole layout of the scene to commence the hunger strike. He couldn't be seen as, oh, I'm going to start another hunger strike. Um, but he had to, he had to, he had to prepare people. He had to go through a process. We're trying. And he had to show the intransigence of the British and their stubbornness. And that's what he done throughout that month of January, 1981, mm. just prior to the hunger strike. So he goes back to Hildridge and he says, we can sort this out. He says, yeah, full conformity. He says, in another one of his meetings, he arrives with the civilian SE clothing. And it's yellow jumpers. But like that yellow shirt. <laughs> Canary yellow jumpers. Sky blue jumpers. Maroon jumpers. Those are the three colours. And Rupert de Bear trousers. Tartan trousers. And brown crocodile shoes. And Hildry says to Bobby, what do you think of that, Bobby? That's the new clothes we've, we've compromised. It'll not be the old grey and blue and striped uniform. You'll be wearing that. And he says, are you serious? You, you, look, you would look, they're going to look like Rupert the Bear coming out in him visits. Mm. People are going to laugh at them even more than the old fucking grey fucking grey mm. suits. Mm. It's, it's still a uniform. He says, I think they're all right. They were, they were being ridiculous. Yeah, try to make it feel you. Yeah. So he says, we're not wearing that air. He says, well, we're trying our best. We're, we're trying to change the uniform, try to dull it down a bit for you. And uh, he says, no. So he says, so I think we'll implement a step-by-step -step approach. And Hildry says, what's that? And it became known as a step-by-step -step approach where you take one step, we'll take a step. So let's, if we try to meet you halfway, um, will you facil facilitate us? He says, yeah, well, well, we'll see. I can report back to the British government, see what Mrs. Thatcher says. So what are you planning? He says, well, 
we were thinking of maybe two wings, one wing in H3, one wing in H5, in a pilot's game, to come off protest. He said that would be good. That that would that would be, that would be positive, a positive development. Two wings of men, four, 45 men in each wing, so that's 90 men coming off a protest. He says, we will, we will reciprocate that. Yeah, okay, it's that goodwill gesture. So wing, wing in three, one wing in five, comes off the protest, stops the no wash, and starts, you know, getting toilet facilities, not putting the excrement on the walls, and um, going to the ablutions to slap out, and um, they're washing, showering, and shaving. So that uh, wasn't my wing. I was in H6 at the time. We were still on the no wash, but uh, these two wings did this. Uh, and then um, Bobby goes to Hildreach and says, can we send their clothes in? He says, sure, we'll see. So he preempts it, Bobby, and tells the families, send the clothes up for the two wings. So they all, all the families arrive with the clothes and they're stopped at the gate. Nope. That was the chance for them to get out of this, the British, but they didn't want out. They wanted a total surrender. And Bobby goes back to Hillary and says, God, you didn't meet us halfway. You're not showing any goodwill at all. He says, no, we're, we've got the reply from Mrs. Thatcher. We want full conformity and you have to accept full criminality because you're criminals. You aren't soldiers. You're criminals. And that was the end of the step-by-step -step approach and the pilot scheme. And the last time I met him, I could re maybe read, uh, do what, would you want me to read a chapter? Yeah, you go, yeah. yeah. Th this probably is the, the period where we're talking about. Mm -hmm. It's a chapter from a book. It's it's chapter 62, where he had just, it was February 81, we were in six, and that's the last time I actually seen him, because they beat them, and because uh, once the clothes didn't come in, he says, right, smash the cells, and go back on protest, and once he hits three, which he was, he was part of that wing, and H5 smashed their cells up, went back in protest, they sent the rat squad, and they beat them to an inch of their lives. They beat them badly, like. But then, because they, they smashed their cells, they went up the R block, H6, and that's when I met him. Hmm. So chapter 62, Bobby's dead, H block 6, um, 1981. I met and spoke with Bobby Sands in February 1981 in H6. We already knew by that stage, that he would be leading the second hunger strike, commencing 1st of March 1981. So the atmosphere in the canteen for Sunday Mass was tense and rather surreal. This was to be my last encounter with Bobby, and I would never see him alive again. So it was quite poignant, and most of the men in the canteen that day got a sense of that. Shortly afterwards, his wing went back to H3, while our wing remained in H6. We had been shifted from H4 to H6 in early November 1980 because of the men coming back from the conforming blocks in support of the first hunger strike. The prison chaplain, Tom Toner, delivered a sermon that day regarding his opposition to the blanket and no-wash protest culminating in the hunger strike. He went on to rail at us about how we had defiled our bodies in a grotesque way through the prison protest. He made a point of how the body was the temple of the Holy Spirit, and we were but stewards of it, and therefore claimed that we had no right to defile it. One prisoner, standing next to Bobby Sands, raised his hand and interjected while pointing to the gold crucifix placed upon the makeshift altar. He said, Father... Did Jesus die on a cross so that others might be free? The prison chaplain, Toner, replied while taking the crucifix into both hands and raising it, Yes, this man, Jesus Christ, at the age of 33, for three hours, an indescribable agony on the cross died so that all of us might be free. The prisoner in question then placed his hand on Bobby's arm and said, Well, Father, this man here, Bobby Sands, is about to lay down his life for all of us, that we might also be free. When, when I looked at Toner, I could tell that he was visibly stunned and for once speechless. Eventually his response came. He said, I never thought about it like that. Is that how you, you all view this hunger strike? Yes, Father, it is, the prisoner replied. Toner finished off the conversation with the words, perhaps I need to go away and think about all this. And the prisoner said, yes, Father, maybe you do need to do that. Bobby was not the same person that I had known earlier in 1978. He behaved differently that day, more solemn in my estimate. My own personal observation that day concluded that he was a man at peace with himself and had resigned himself to his destiny and fate. The usual sparkle in his eyes had gone and I noticed that he kept staring at the floor the whole time during Mass, as if in a pensive mood. When Mass ended, he went clockwise around the canteen, as if bidding farewell to his beloved troops, to the men who had stayed the course, and despite everything that had been thrown against us, had remained steadfast refusing to allow the defeat of the Republican struggle in Ireland. 
I watched as Bobby shook each of their hands. When he came to me, he smiled and said, I see you're still here, grabbing my hand and putting it in his. At that moment in time, I felt an incredible sadness sweep over me as I answered, There's nowhere else to go, Bobby. There's nowhere else to go. He held my hand in his and said, Good man, stay strong. He then moved on to the man standing next to me, who asked, How come, Bobby, you have a pot belly and we don't? All three of us laughed. At the same time, and Bobby replied, Maggie, that's because I've been eating most of my cellmate's grub, as it will keep me alive longer during this hunger strike. I then asked him who his cellmate was, and Bobby turned and pointed to a man standing behind him. That man there, Malachi Keery, he replied. After mass, Pat McKeown, who was our black OC in H6, ordered me up to the back window because I initially told him that I didn't feel like talking. When I went to the window, Pat asked me how I felt about Bobby and what had just happened in the canteen minutes earlier, and I told him that I felt shattered. He then said, Was that another body experience? What was that? We have just seen a dead man walking. In the run-up to the 5th of May 1981, we were under no illusion as to what was coming our way, but we felt helpless in ourselves and were acutely aware that Bobby was about to lay down his life for us specifically in an attempt to end the years of brutality and inhumanity we were suffering. Of course, he was dying for the Irish Republic and for the oppressed Irish people in the wider sense, but for us within the prisons it was much more personal and intimate, and we all knew it. Bobby in many ways had steeled us prior to the 5th of May 1981, because he had explained in written comms or communiques, read, to us, read out to us what was at stake in the hunger strike. For example, in one of his written statements, he had stated that he was confident that he could achieve anything provided that the 300 blanket men and the heroic women in Armagh prison stood behind him. In other words, he was only as good as his weakest link and depended upon us holding the line after he was gone, and equally, we depended upon him. So we were all intricately linked by that stage. On the 9th of April 1981, while we were in H6, we heard the news of his victory in the Fermanagh South Throne by election, which made him an MP in the Houses of an English Parliament. Our morale was boosted, to say the least, but when Thatcher merely shifted the goalpost and ignored us by implementing legislation to prevent the same scenario happening again, we were deflated yet again. We were moved again in the, in the latter half of April 1981 to H3 and continued the long waiting game on the fate of Bobby. Finally, on the 5th of May 1981, I heard the click of boots coming down the wing and immediately went to the cell door and peered out through the slit at the top of the door. I noticed two prison guards, along with the prison chaplain, Tom Toner, stopped outside the cell opposite, housing Brenton Hughes, the Dark, and John Nixon. When their cell door opened, only the priest entered, and after a few minutes he left. Within seconds, Brenton Hughes, with his voice breaking, shouted down the wing, Bobby's dead. With that shattering announcement, I moved slowly away from the cell door and entered another world, which I initially found alien to me, and I've been trying to come to terms with ever since, and I know that I'm not on my own. The lads in the wing were hurt beyond comprehension, terminating any conversations they were having at the back window or cell door. Although we were all bracing ourselves for his death, it still came as a devastating blow and had the capacity to tear us into shreds. I cried and cried until I could weep no more, most of it in the silence of my own cell. My cellmate Jim McCubrey looked the other way with tears in his eyes as well. However, coupled with the tears, there was also an unparalleled rage and anger at this act of callousness by Margaret Thatcher and her government towards us and our people who actually dared to support us. Bobby had called upon us to be steadfast in the wake of his death and we responded as he had requested. So gradually we wiped away our tears and hardened our hearts and strapped on our armour once again, this time with more grit determination than ever before. If Thatcher and her government thought they had crushed us, then we were going to prove her wrong. The blanket men were now truly back in business, and this time it was personal. Fundamentally, this was going to be a fight to the death because between us and Thatcher, with everyone else, as onlookers. Bobby's death had pierced our hearts like no other death, and changed our lives forever. He had not let us down, and we were certainly determined not to let him down in life or in death. The fight would continue. In the early hours of the next morning, Pat McKeown, who possessed the crystal radio, wrapped a pipe and told me to get up to the window. While standing there, he told me the following. 
Reports are coming in of hundreds of Molotov cocktails arcing their way towards British Army and RUC lines across the north. The British have just breathed new life into our struggle, without even knowing it, and guaranteed that this war will extend by another 10 years at least. The problem with the English is they think that they are perfectly correct, when in actual fact they are absolutely wrong. Postscript I arose this morning as the screw came. He thumped my door heavily without speaking. I stared at the walls and thought I was dead. It seems that this hell will never depart. The door opened and it wasn't closed gently, but it didn't really matter. We weren't asleep. I heard a bird and yet didn't see the dawn of day. Would that I were deep inside the earth. Where are my thoughts of days gone by? And where is this life I th once thought was in the world? My cry is unheard and my tears flowing unseen. When our day comes, I will probably not be there. Oglak, Bobby Sands. How hard is that for you to read out of that and, and go over it? That's, uh, I don't read that. I, I, re I relive it. Mm -hmm. that, that book isn't about, um, I was four years of hard graft, hard work. It was a labor of love, like, but it's, uh, I'm proud of every chapter, if you know what I mean, because it took so long to do it and I didn't go to the book until I was ready to go to the book to do another chapter because most of the, a lot of the chapters were just pure rubbish. They were, it was literally rubbish. So they were all bent. And what's left is the, it's a bit like an artist when he gets the final paint and he goes, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> that's how I feel about that book. That's it. And it's all, my, my whole soul is poured into that book, if you know what I mean. And I've tried to give the lads who died a voice, mm -hmm. you know, because they can't speak for themselves, James, because they're dead. Yeah, and you've lived that. How hard does that look when you lose 10 of your comrades inside a prison fighting for a belief that they're willing to give their life for it? Were you ever thinking that it's never going to create any change? We never thought it would end up, you know, making the gains that we did. And I know it's not all rosy in the garden. Uh, every blanket man, former blanket man, former prisoner has their own view in life and they're all entitled to it because the dark was one of the ones that taught us don't be putting your whole trust in your own leadership. They're all made up of humans and human beings are fundamentally weak and vulnerable and can be compromised and are corruptible. Put your faith in yourselves. So blanket men are, are able to deal with each other's criticisms. But beyond that, we can rise above the politics of each other and our stance. And fundamentally, we, are, we see ourselves as brothers. There's more humanity. Humanity to us is more important than politics. Mm -hmm. So when Bobby dies, when you get word that there's over 100,000 people at his funeral, what are you thinking there? From 300 people to then 10,000 to then over 100,000, like the word is then the strength is understanding that we're all, everyone's coming together. Like what are you thinking then? Did you start to then get a bit more belief that, okay, something is, that when um, Brendan says that like, we're going to do this for change and Write, rewrite the history books that was that was that was that a moment there when you when you thought that okay this is no. this is possible or did you still think no 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 it's, it's we weren't thinking like that at all mm -hmm. we were in a, a goldfish bowl um it was personal and from that see from that moment that he dies we don't care about anybody or anything we're not interested in the ira we're not interested in the army council if they're standing on board stop the hunger strike we're telling them f off this is between us and them. This is us and Thatcher. Everybody else stay out of this. This is a dog fight to the end. And the only people involved in this is us and her. That's how personal this became. So as one man dies, another one picks up the baton. Hmm. And that's where this brotherhood comes in, if you know what I'm saying. Yeah. There's a chain of events starts happening. So as the hunger strike continues, it, our, we get hardened, our attitudes harden. But does that then become... But it's nothing to do with the outside. Yeah. So that... But does that then become... Uh, like in bad territory where because then you've forgot what you've actually fighting for because then you've just went 100 percent i'm never no matter what happens i'm not giving up is that partially because the third hunger strike these were fucked over so your trust is totally gone that no matter what you should do now you're on the yeah, yeah. this is uh, you got it you're on the same wavelength mm -hmm. as me that's yeah. exactly what's happening I'm trying to explain something that happened 40 years ago to somebody who wasn't there. Yeah. But I want you to be there. So I'm trying to, I'm trying to even yeah. in the book, I try to take people on a journey. Yeah. You know, it's, 
I'm going out on my road. I'm trying my best. To simplify it for people to yeah, understand. To simplify. What you were thinking at that time. Yeah. And that's totally understandable that because there would be no trust anyway. The so trust was gone because of the first. Yeah. yeah. So you're, how can you trust anybody that's going to come in with another 32 pages or how many pages to say, mm. yeah, we can give you this, this and this. It's just a case of we're not accepting it anymore. Yeah. We're going to kill you or you can kill us. It's as simple as yeah. that. Is yeah. that what it came to? Yes. It was a gladiatorial mm -hmm. uh, fight. Mm -hmm. It was to, to gladiators and there weren't, there was no end to this. So when it reaches, <clears throat> um, the thinking was, this is going to go on until 1982 because we've got 72 more than you. Mm -hmm. We have 72 hunger strikers. Huh? And by that stage in September, um, word, you know, the, the blocks we see was telling two men in our wing. We had two. We were two, there was 10, eventually by September 1981, there was 10 men dead, 13 in, in prison hospitals, some of them in comas. But we also in our 72 ready for hunger strike action. Two of them were in our wing. So the Black Sochi shouted over, many men's in that wing for hunger strike, uh, two. And the OC was shouting down, you, st you still on that list? Yeah. Okay. Albert and Affair, right, tell the men. That makes it 72. There's 10 dead, 13 in the hospitals, and 72 ready for a hunger strike, including them too. Tell them too. There's nothing down there, only death. There's no strategy here anymore. Tell them that there's more than likely they're both of them will probably be dead within the next few weeks without an outcome. And the wings will say, did you get that? And two of them shout out, yeah, I got it. What's your response? Lana I carry on. Carry on. Because of the men who had went before. They weren't going to let them down. So it was all about, not so much the flag. It wasn't about that or the glory of Ireland. It wasn't about that. It was about, we're brothers and I won't let you down. One goes, we all go. Yes. And I won't let you down. Mm -hmm. But that means if I say, I give you my promise, I won't let you down. And you go out and you die and I live. That's not, that's not part of the deal. <laughs> yeah. That's not part of the deal. Do you think that's where Brendan? Yes. Yes. Struggled. Mm-hmm. He, like, he, he lived when it's he, like the captain of a ship in it like if it goes down as I, I don't know if this is true but you've got to go down with the ship uh, uh, that would be it yes mm -hmm. absolutely mm -hmm. yeah so another 72 kids man ready to go mm -hmm. it's, so i was going on into 1982. it's mad to think that because there's also more tragedy while you were in the h blocks because your brother michael came to see you is mm. that's correct as well isn't it? yes and yes. to say he's joining the irish the, the IRA, IRA, yeah and you were against it Somebody in the canteen told me mm -hmm. in uh, February 79, he says, your, your Megals joined the IRA. Like, Jesus Christ. I was horrified. I was thinking, what the hell? I came out of nowhere. You know, my dad was dead. I was meant to look after the house, but I had to fight for Ireland's freedom and, the, and my people. So Mick, I told Mick, look after the family. He says, I'll do that. I'll just hold the fort until I get out. I'll do it. And then somebody in Mass tells somebody at, 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 in Mass tells me he's joined the IRA. So I sent a visit out for him in March '79, and he came up. And I couldn't restrain myself, even though the screws were all milling about. I says, "Get out of it!" He says, oh, "Calm down." I says, "Get out of it!" He says, uh, "Sure, why don't you tell the Germans?" Huh? Go on, because the screws were all listening. You know, they're all walking about. I says, "Go on, tell the Germans." She says, what are you talking about? I says, I'm talking about you and the IRA. Get out of it. I told you to hold a fort until I get out. He says, I can't. She says, look at the state of you. You're like a skeleton. He says, I can help you, bro. Here's me. You can't help me. You can't help me. Nobody can help me. You have to hold the fort until I get out. My mum, think of my dad. My dad's dead. You have to hold the fort. He says, no, he says, I, I can help you. I want to help you. You do it for me. I'll do it for you. I couldn't, I'm not leaving. I'm not getting out of it. I can help you. You fight on the inside, I'll fight on the outside. We'll be brothers together. There's, me, there's no talking to you. He says, do you give me your blessing? No, I don't. I don't give you my blessing. Get out of the IRA. Can you hear me? Get out of it. I was like raising at him. He says, this is going to end in tears. One way or another, you're going to end up in here. You're going to get killed. Get out of it. He says, no, I can't. You do it for me. I'll do it for you. That's all he said, Sam. So he asked me again at the end because your screw came in. It was only a 30 minutes visit. He put the security book down, right? Visit terminated. 
You ever, is there no talking to you? He says, no. He says, do you give me your blessing? I promise I'll not let you down. There's my, I reluctantly give him it because there was no talking to him. Here's me, don't you end up in here and don't get killed. And he says, I won't. He says, I'll fire 15 shots for you tonight. That was his last words to me. That was it. He got up, I stopped and looked back at him. He went, waved back. I never seen him again. That was in March, 79. And he was shot? Yeah, the screws, um, it was a really hot day. 12th of July, 1979. And, um, it's like that particular day, everything sort of like stands still. It's, I can smell the day. I've got the vivid images of the whole day and everything so vivid, the blue sky, the sun coming through the steel grills. And I said to myself, I, my life can't get any worse than this. And then the maggots coming out of the corner and then the excrement on the light bulkhead and then they're all flaking. Once the excrement dries, it starts flaking, like a little ash, just bags of ash coming down from the bulkhead. And um, it was between half 12 and two o'clock lock up. I heard the click of boots coming down and stopped outside my cell door and he opened it. It was uh, Mr. Keary, senior officer. He says, Kearney, the governor wants to see you. It's about your family. And um, I said, well, you know the order. I'm, I'm not going to see the governor because you have to wear the uniform. I'm not doing it. So he closed the door and about five minutes later, I kicked uh, my cellmate, Nana. I kicked the, the, the sponge mattress. He was laying posing. I says, Don, I get up. I think a governor's coming. So he got up, wrapped the blanket around him. He went into one corner. I stood in the other. And they came back. And the whole entourage came in. Um, the, the governor, senior officer, about four blue shirts, screws, all piled into the cell. And the governor, he, he, we called him Alfred Hitchcock because he looked like Alfred Hitchcock. He looked exactly like him. Weak grey flannel suit and baldy head. Weak pubby belly. So his real name was Samuel Chambers. But uh, he looked like Alfred Hitchcock. So Hitchcock came in and he says, Derry, get out. So the screws took him out. And he says to me, why did you not come out to see me? I told you, I sent Mr. Carey down for you. It's about your family. I says, you know the order. I'm not allowed to wear a uniform. I'm glad to see you. He says, um, many brothers of you. I says, um, of two. I says, what age is they now, Kearney? I says, um, they're 20. They're twins. They're 20. He says, uh, what's their names? Here's me, Michael and Sean. He says, see the one called Michael? And he says, yeah, you don't call him Michael anymore. How do you feel about that? I mean, feel okay. He says, do you feel good? I mean, no, I don't feel good. But do you feel okay? Yeah, I feel okay. Do you want to see a priest? Yeah, I'll see a priest. And walked out. Nana came back in. He says, what's all that about? I says, I think our Michael's dead. He says, you don't call him Michael anymore. And um, so I shouted up to the OC, officer commanding of the wing, the OC, and I just says, um, I think my brother's dead. It was all in Gaelic, for me a hard boss. And um, I need to go out and see the, the visit. And he says, Lana, I go ahead. It's a priest's visit. Uh, and Irish, that's Sagard. So it's a Sagard, Kurt Sagard. And he says, go ahead. If it's a special priest visit to do with a bereavement, you can wear the uniform. So put the uniform on, I went out, and the screw on that day was Billy McAllister, and he was one of the Brown Armour's sadistic branch. These people specialize in torture. And um, here's my heart, she said, no, this is just my luck, getting Billy McAllister. No, oh, no. Right, Kearney, what's your fucking name, you Fenian bastard? I says, I haven't got a name. I haven't got a number. What's your number? What's your number, Fenian bastard? Um... He said, I said, I haven't got a number. He says, your number is 998. So what's your number? I haven't got a number. And my only objective was getting down to the priest's visit to find out what happened. And uh, he was my obstacle. But it was a really hot day and he was walking a meter behind me. And um, he was starting to carry on again, slobbering. We called him Busted Sofa. He had a blue shirt, but it was two sizes too small for him. Buttons. He had a big pat belly. Mm -hmm. And the buttons kept popping. <laughs> <laughs> so he just started looking like a busted sofa so we called him busted sofa so busted sofa started um did i currently a pro bastard no let's have him washed you're an animal you're not even human and that just ignored him but uh, when it got, an got to an internal wall screw was on with a guard dog 
and they knew each other and it was a glorious 12th and he shouts over I'll see you later at the field Billy and he shouts I'll see you later and he says the dog was barking the Alsatian it was like really barking and he says do you want me to set that dog on that bastard I'm fucking going to get at the death here he's going to fucking set a dog on me I'm not, I'm not even going to make him for this and here's Billy uh, what do you think he says I set that dog on that bastard said he's trying to escape what do you think here he is the dog was barking and he says no let it go but he says let it go he says um he says this father hasn't watched in two years he says he probably killed the dog <laughs> he's that diseased and they all had a good old laugh got into the visit anyway and the priest for Matt Wallace was there and he was chain smoking and he was sweating I remember the sweat coming down his face it was a really hot day and he says Seamus I'm the parish priest from your local area London Oliver Plunkett yeah, right, I don't know, don't know you. Uh, I've just taken over. He says, this is a really bad news, sit down. Here's me, that's okay. I had him up in March. I got him a fucking rollicking. I says, um, is he dead? He says, yeah, he's dead. I says, for, I know he was a volunteer. Was it the British Army or the RUC? He says, you know, this is probably going to be the worst news conceivable. You need to sit down. Here's me. I don't want to sit down. I just want to need to know who shot him. Was it the British Army, the RUC? He says, it was the Irish Republican Army. People you're fighting for. Here's me. Jesus. My legs buckled. I sat down, all right. And everything crushed. Everything became frozen. And I looked at his mouth and it was moving. But I couldn't hear a thing. I couldn't hear a word he was saying. And I entered no man's land then. He said, did you hear me? Here's my... Um, where is he? He says he's lying on the border. On the Fermanagh border. He says, um, the Irish Republican Publicity Bureau have released a statement at two o'clock this afternoon. He says, who's that? He says, I don't know. He says, it's some arm of the Republican movement. The Irish Republican Publicity Bureau? Never heard of them. He says, yeah, they've released a statement. He says he was one of their volunteers. He was executed as an informer. He was spying on them for the, for the British. I, mean, I give him my blessing in March and he done that on me. He betrayed me, betrayed the struggle, betrayed our family. He deserved that. He says, well, I don't know. I says, how's my mum? Oh, she's distraught. She wants to know what's your next move. What are you going to do? He says, I don't really know. I don't know who I'm That's here. So he left and I was pushed out of the visits. And... um first person I ran into was Kieran Doherty. He died in a hunger strike, but me and him were friends. I said, Rim, Rim uh, you heard boss? Brother's dead. He says, okay, hey, who done it? He says, um, Rim, I said, run the shallity, eh? And he thought I said soldiers. Run the sedgery, eh? No, ugly in the hern. All right, here is what? And he knew our Michael, knew me, knew the family. And screw it, pushed him on. And then worst thing happened to me was um, Billy. He was my torturer on the way down. He was my saviour on the way back up. Why? He grabbed my arm. I didn't like that. He always walked a metre behind me, but now he was done in my defence area. He was right up. And he grabbed my arm, like at my right arm. He me, don't be doing that, Billy. He says, no, it's all right. He says, it's okay, Kearney. I heard. <laughs> What'd you hear? He says, I heard the Provies shot your bra. And he's landing like a dog on the border in Fermanagh. He says, your war's over. Nah. He says, you're with us now. And I was neither with them or I was neither with the IRA. I, was with, I didn't know who the hell I was with. I was shell-shocked, moving around a battlefield. But I knew it myself. That soldier quality of yours, big lad, you need to get into action here because you're in a fucking battlefield here. That's what I was telling myself. I'm shell-shocked here. I need to fucking find out where the hell I am. And he says, uh, if it was my brother... I remember the, the conversation. Some people say to me, hey, you remember conversations from 40 years ago? I says, of course it's possible. And I have a photographic memory. And I verified that with my brother. He says, I read the book. That chapter is absolutely right. Because the chapter's about our Sean coming up the next day. I says, I remember that conversation. Did I get that wrong? No, I read the book. Yeah, it's 100%. Of course you can remember conversations from 40 years ago. Especially when they're pivotal moments. Seminal events. 
And he says to me, um, if it was me, I'd hunt him down for the rest of my life. And we came to a fork in the road inside the camp. That way was to the conformant blocks, H8, and that way was back to the protesting blocks, H4 and 3 and 5. And um, he stopped and he had my security book and he was waving it about. Black security book. And he says, I'm not letting you go any further. I'm stopping you right here. And I just looked at him and went, fuck, he looks like a Presbyterian minister. And well, Babel and Han, he's my saviour. He says, I'm not letting you go any further. He says, you're at the, cr you're, you're at the crossroads in your life. And he says, uh, yeah, and you're going to have to make a decision. What age are you? Here's me, 22. He says, um, well, it's time to grow up. He says, and you're at the crossroads. So what's it to be? That way? To the conformant blocks? Or that way? Back to the ones that murdered your brother. Make your time. Make your mind up. And it was a seminal moment. And it was going to define me. Did you question it? I did question it. Do you then become a target if your brother became an informant? Do no. you become a target that no. because it's your family by, linked? by the IRA? Yeah, because your brothers. No, no, no. They would. They mm. wouldn't think like that. Why did you question it then? Uh, I questioned myself at that crossroads because mm -hmm. I knew this is going to be a, the decision I make is going to define me for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. I felt that this. He was right about that. He was stupid. He was cross. He was just a, mer a paid mercenary out to torture us and had been, but. He actually came off with a sensible, the, uh, the sensible phrase, a sensible phrase, and the fact that he says this is, you're at the crossroads in your life. So I thought that way, that way, and my feet carried me, not my brain. My feet carried me that way, back to H four to the lads, and I baffled him. And when I looked back, he had his, he took his hat off, and for the first time, I realised he was bald, because he had always wore a hat. And the first thing came into my head, he took his hat off and started scratching it. And here's me. Billy McAllister's bald. Fuck. I never knew that. I have to tell the lads. He's actually no hurt under that cap is. <laughs> A slight thing has kept you going. Uh -huh. You know, such profound moments mm -hmm. and you're going stinking silly, silly things. Mm -hmm. I don't know wh wh what happens there with the human mind. Hear me, fuck. I have to tell the lads. He's actually bald. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. And I still remember him thinking. And then he, he run up alongside me to my right. He says, why are we doing this? He says, why are we doing what, Billy? He says, so we started talking about philosophy. He wouldn't understand the word, but that's what it was. I realized when I look back on it. He says, why are we doing this? Why are we going back to H4 and not the other way? I says, I don't know, Billy, you tell me. You tell me. You seem to know it all. He says, right, let me work it out. Ah, oh, right. And so we're walking back into the back the four. I got it. I got it. Here's me. What do you got? Tell me. What is it? Why am I going back? The reason, Kearney, why you're going back to H4 is, and not the other way to the conformant box, to H8, is because you're dedicated to your cause. Got it. Here's me. Do you get it? I wouldn't please him. What I said? No. He wanted, he wanted to rationalize. He wanted to tell the statistic branch back in H4, what's that bastard doing back? We're even throwing dead bodies at him and he's still not breaking. That would have unnerved them. Fuck. We've tried, we've starved him out, we've beat him. We've put shit in the food. We've murder searched him, sexually assaulted him. We've fucking dead bodies been thrown at him. He's fucking back for more. Oh Jesus. That would have unnerved them. So they would have wanted a rationale for that. So Billy was going to tell him, he was going to go into the canteen. It's okay, boys. I was with them. What's that fucker doing back? It's okay. I've got it sorted. I've got it. I was talking to him. I'm inside his head. It was all about mind games yeah. back then. It was all mind games. Get inside their head and break mm. them. And because um, they couldn't do it physically. And uh, he was going to, oh, well, he's dedicated to his cause. Oh, I've got it. I've got it. I've got a feel from a wee bit more pressure here. Maybe, maybe a wee bit of pressure where we'll break him. We'll get him. We'll get him in the end. But I said, no, you're wrong. No, you're not dedicated. No, no, I'm not dedicated. So what's the reason why we're coming back? I says, uh, it's a strange world we're living in. That's all I said to him. It's a strange world. I wouldn't please him. But we'll come back in anyway. The circle screw made me face the wall. He says, face the wall. I wouldn't do it. He smacked me in the face. Started smacking me around the head. And the, the governor's door was open. And there was two governors sitting there. One was Chambers and another one. 
two of them were watching the baiting and um, I kept turning around. He kept smacking me in the face. Face the wall, no smack. Face the wall, no smack. The Nazi, Nazi style slaps the face. And then Chambers shouts out after about four slaps. He says, stop assaulting that prisoner. And the screw looked at him because the governor was the ones giving the orders to bait us. And then he shouted and stopped assaulting prison, that prisoner. So the governor and the, the screw's looking, you're, you're giving the order for me to be brutalized seasons, and then you're telling me to stop. He says, bring him to me, bring him in here. So he, sh he shoved me, frog marched me across the circle into the governor's office. He says, good, I can close the door. There was a middle class thing going on with the governors too. There was different levels in the cash, long cash. You had the working class screws. You had the middle class governors and then AGs. There was all maybe 20 or 30 of them, but they're all middle class, wore suits. They were all pretty, you know, university educated. Yeah. And so see, going through all that, then losing your brother, losing your comrades to the hunger strike, losing so many other people. Like, when did the demands get settled? When did that agreement happen? Um, well, after the the hunger strike, uh, just to finish off, when I when I went in to see the governor, um, he just says, "Currently, I can get you out of here," and um, he says, um, "I apologise also for the fact that I that I um, broke that news about your brother." Um, in, in the way it did uh, I apologise it's not the way one human being should treat an or do you agree here's me I agree he says so do you want to you need to get out we'll give you compassion and parole here's me that's what I want you'd be, you'd be with your mother and, and all that and he says yes I'll, we'll get all that sorted out I just need an undertaking that you don't come back here you go into the criminal box he says I'm not going to I can't you know he says give me a written undertaking I didn't give him that he says well give me a verbal undertaking that you'll not come back and I said, I don't think I can do that. He says, why is that? Why can you not give me a verbal or a written undertaking? He says, when your brother's been murdered by the people you're fighting for, your own army stabbed you in the back. I says, the black man didn't do it. He says, why, why, you, why are you doing this? I says, because I'm a soldier. You're a soldier. Yeah, and he turned to the governor, the, the AG beside him. He says, Kearney's a soldier. And the governor beside him, I remember him looking up in the eyes, like rolling the eyes. Here we go again. He says, you, you, what, what, are you a soldier of Northern Ireland? I says, no, don't recognize Northern Ireland. I'm a soldier of Ireland. And he says, are you a soldier of, of the North or the South? I says, I don't recognize the 300 mile frontier. I'm a soldier of Ireland. I'm fighting. What are you fighting for? I says, I'm fighting for my people. I'm fighting for ultimately freedom for our country as well. Get rid of that border. He says, are you going to give me that undertaking so I can let you out to see your at the at the funeral, he says no, and he I was refused compassion and parole, didn't get out the the funeral, and um, so it, it continued anyway until nineteen eighty. We've explained that, and then nineteen eighty one, throughout the ten men dead, the ten men died, and on the third of October nineteen eighty one, the hunger strike ended, and it ended with a number of demands being granted. The new secretary of state was Jim Pryor, and he issued a a, a package of measures. He gave us 50% remission back. So the four years I lost, I got uh, f two years back. Um, uh, we got rid of the, the, the badge of criminality, the, the, the criminal uniform. We were able to wear our own clothes. And then we got the association. So three of the demands were granted. Um, the only thing that didn't, that was still, there was still an outstanding issue that was segregated. Free association came under like segregation. That's what we were looking for. Like free association, we got one visit a week, one parcels. So all that was sorted out. The clothes issue was sorted out. Uh, the remission fifty percent. The matters halfway. You didn't get hundred percent. You got fifty percent. But there was still an issue over our own wings or what we would want Republican wings. Mm -hmm. That would be tantamount to political status. Getting your own Republican wings, being separated from criminals and loyalists, and that wasn't granted. And also the work issue. They still wanted. They called it tasks. So instead of saying go to work to say carry out the task so that wasn't resolved but um the following year we went into the conformant blocks and um eventually uh through acts of sabotage and we forced the loyalists to lock up and we were given we were granted um segregation in october 1982 a year after the hunger strike and the following year through the, the great escape the mass breakout um through the hennessy report he says all them prisoners are too dangerous to send the work so the workshops closed and all five demands were granted by September 1983. We'd won. And how was that feeling for you? Uh, it was a glorious day when I got my clothes. What did you wear? Did you not wear a pink shirt or something? <laughs> and you thought the style was still in from five years That's ago? That's right. It was a, it was a, a 
of a pink shirt, flared <laughs> trousers, <laughs> white socks, mm -hmm. canary yellow jumper. Yeah. <laughs> Yellows always come into your life. Yeah, yellow, oh, yellow. plays a big part. Yellow cars, yeah. yellow cars, yellow civilian issue clothing, mm -hmm. your yellow jumper today. Mm -hmm. It's all bringing back bad memories. Oh, for fuck. <laughs> Sorry, James, you shouldn't be wearing that. <laughs> yeah. So when you eventually that, like, you should come in with a black hole know, pulling yeah. that jumper. <laughs> <laughs> when they uh, get like going through your whole life, like the misery, the torment, losing your brother, I think pro partially probably blames yourself to this day. That like, you look at Brendan losing his, his potential kids, blaming yeah. himself, like going through all that, and then thinking there's never going to be an ending. You're going to die in there. Mm -hmm to then winning like how was you and the other people around you feeling did you feel some sort of victory or did you feel more pain because of what he's had to go through uh, there's a whole period of mourning you yeah. went through the gra grieving pro process but um by 1983 new men were coming in and that was good fresh troops were coming in because the war was still going on and they were completely oblivious so while we were on the blanket they said they they coined the phrase we ended up on the duvet because of you guys who were on the blanket, you just won all our demands. So they were all coming in right up until when the camp closed in July 2000. Those guys from 1981, 82, well, from about 82 on, they were just, they were having a life of luxury. But we turned it into the Lazy K. It was a holiday camp. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, one of the torturers was a guy called the Red Rat. And um, Brian, he used to call me Seamus. And I called him Brian. And we had that rapport while he was torturing me. He would always say, Seamus, you deserve this. And, that went on for years. But the Red Rat anyway, I remember uh, going out to uh, the circle this day, to the MO, and this would have been 1985. It was all over. We had our own Republican wings. The Loyalists had their wings. And the criminals had their wings. They were called mixed wings. And it was all over. Newcomers were coming in. There, you were sunbathing in the yard. You were had your multi-gyms. Yeah. It was pretty good, like, you know. Mm -hmm. It was a great film. It was a great feeling, like, getting yeah. a good tan. And in the, the, the summer of 1982, I got a brilliant tan. And 83, mm -hmm. it was a great tan. So we were just, like, loving life. And 1982, 83, it was great. But in 85, um, the Red Rat shouted at me in uh, uh, March 85, I think it was. I was going out, and he says, Seamus. And I went, oh, Jesus, Brian. He's one of the torturers. He he led the sadistic branch. He says, where are you going, Seamus? I says, Brad, I'm going to see the MO. Why are you going to see the MO for? The medical officer. I says, Brad, if we touch of acne on my back, oh, I'm going to get cream for it. He says, going to see the doctor. My, my, my. Whatever happened to the big rough, tough Provo? Fucking going to see the doctor. Huh? Four years on the blanket protest, and you're going to see the doctor for a bit of cream. Do you know what I mean? She knows, excuse me, Brian, I understand exactly what you mean. Hardcore Spartan, going to see a fucking doctor. I know, Brian. But I says, sure, it's all over. We won. He says, oh, no. I says, sure, we won in the end anyway. Sure, we got everything. You just lost, we won. Oh, no. You admit it? Oh, well. Oh, well, you just won. I says, here, Brian, what about coming down into the Republican wings? I'm officer commanding. I'll let you down. And we can talk about the old days, just me and you. We'll talk about the blanket protest, eh? Eh? The four years of torture. You'll never get me down them wings, Kearney. Forget about it. Ah, oh, come on, just for the old times, Brian, me and you. Come on. A cup of tea. I'll make you a cup of tea. No, you'll never get me down them wings. So that's the stage that had reached by 1984, 85. Mm. You know what I mean? It was over. There was fresh troops coming in, and they were oblivious to all that suffering. So yeah. um, for Brian... Um, justice was served and he was killed on the 4th of October 1988 when you when you were getting out going through all that getting your release date how were you feeling um, well I got a, I spent nearly 10 years in jail in prison um, over 4 years on the blanket protest so when I got out I got out on Valentine's Day 1986 and um, I got out with £35 in my pocket the governor gave me £35 he says um I said to myself, I'm going to I'm gonna double that. I'm going to turn that into £70. And I did. And then I doubled that. And I doubled that. And I doubled that. And I eventually set up my own business. Had men working for me. Became a successful businessman. Even through all the misery and pain mm. you endured. Yeah, still run the business. Yeah, congratulations, brother. Like, never giving up. And it's for anybody that there's people not been through a 10 foot you've been through and can't get out. But when you talk about misery and pain and mm. 
it's like probably being in hell would imagine worse oh yeah if, if there is that like, yeah to then coming through and writing your successful book and still being a good bubbly character through <laughs> well you say the dark humor laughing in there making jokes and yeah your memory is very strong as well. I've been listening through dates and certain times and names like you remember all mm -hmm. that. Like, mm -hmm. So I'd imagine you keep repeating it as well. Uh, uh, it's yeah. just like a fucking a revolving door going it around is. in your head. Oh yeah. yeah. Uh, it's intrusive images. Mm -hmm. Intrusive. But, um, what's important for this story as well, we talk about Michael, your brother again, your mum came to you yeah. and wanted to find out what actually happened to your brother. So I so, think it's the best yeah, that you obviously. Yeah, 1986 I got yeah. out. But the, the year before that, there was a military stalemate. And um, we were far from being defeated, <laughs> and uh, we, had, we were galvanized. And um, there was to be a Tet offensive to be launched, um, another big push by the IRA. I wanted to be part of it. And um, when I got out, that was my intention to return to the army to launch the Tet, help launch the Tet offensive against the British. But well, my mom and I had a walk down the Glen Road in March uh, 86, and we had the dog with us, Rory the dog. <laughs> and she says to me, Son, what do you intend to do? Now that you're out here, my mum, I'm only out four weeks. I'm going to take uh, two years or an hour. Two years, yeah. And maybe go away in the continent or something like that for a while, you know. But just, just uh, I'm just taking two years rest and relaxation um, and then recalibrating. To be honest, ma'am, we're going to, we, we've launched, a, going to start launching a military offensive here. It's called the TAT. I want to be part of it, you know. We're going to pay back Thatcher for what you've done on the lads. We're going to give her a bloody nose. Here is son, she deserves everything she gets. But I'm gonna give you a task. Um, I've stood by you for nearly 10 years and I, I need for you to stand by me. Here's me, what are you talking about, mum? She says, I need for you to find out what happened to my son, Michael. Here's my mum, I wouldn't even know where to start. The IRA has never cleared its own volunteers, ever, from its inception in 1916. They're not gonna start with me. He says, I, I know it's a poison chalice. I'm a Republican. I'm a trooper. I'm with them. He says, well, that's your task. You can do it for me. I stood by you. you. Now you have to stand by me. So I promised her I would try and find out. And it took, it took a long time, painstaking, because they are right, don't clear their own. And eventually, anyway, uh, it was in October 2001, a few failed attempts. And then I studied and waited until the polit political climate changed. And when I heard Martin McGinnis say on the radio something about the conflict is coming to an end, and this is a time for the, the heart uh, to be, you know, the, the the wounds to be healed, and for unanswered questions to be answered. And here's my fingers, my that's my cue there. So the climate had changed, political climate was changing, and it was after the Good Friday Agreement of April 1998. So I moved, <coughs> approached the the army again, the leadership, and. Um, because I was one of their volunteers, um, I felt I had a, a foot in the door and the, the climate was changing. And in October 2001, the army launched an investigation into the circumstances surrounding what happened to Michael. And uh, it lasted up until the 28th of January, 19, or 2000 and 2003. So from October 2001 to January 2003, an army investigation took place at a leadership level as to find out what happened to him. And um, they came back basically saying that uh, he was cleared, that he wasn't an informer. Uh, and the, the army had cleared him at leadership level. And the, to go into the detail of it, um, I wouldn't really be prepared to go into the detail. It's too complex, but it's just uh, just the fact that, that, that he, he wasn't an informer, he was executed. I says, that's part one. I need to look at part two. He says, well, we are not involved in part two. Mm -hmm then we're not interested in part two. We have basically cleared your brother from being an informer. He wasn't an informer. And that's, that's we were happy with that. And so I knew there was going to be a part two. I always knew there's something not right about this, but couldn't put my finger on it. But my mum was in her 80s and I wasn't prepared to go. So I went along with mm -hmm. chapter one. Or yeah, part and you were one. happy with that. Yeah, yeah and my mum was happy that before she passed. Yes. Mm -hmm. But in 2016, part two started. And that's when my my lawyer contacted me in July 2016. And he says, um, I'll ask you a few questions and then you can answer. So I went down to see him in Belfast. And he says, what's this about? That was, uh, was August 2016. He says, um, uh, 
we have uncovered files from the British and they were involved in the execution of your brother. They set him up. They had infiltrated the internal security unit through other people, including, but not only, but including uh, Steak Knife. So Steak Knife was there when your brother was executed, but he was a double agent working for the force research unit. And your brother was set up from Castlereagh to, through the, to the force research unit and into the internal security unit, which had been infiltrated. So the internal security unit of the IRA who arrested Michael and took him across the border were working for the British and they executed him. Hmm. So when you, you're talking about your story, there's, I don't know if it's a congratulation or not, but you've just became my longest podcast mate over three hours. Like the big that man, deserves. The big man can talk, here, I tell you. That deserves a hand. <laughs> yeah. It does. <laughs> but uh, we just got a couple more See, questions. I, I set out to do that. She says, you are going to break before him. I says, no, James English is going to break before him. <laughs> <laughs> I would never challenge you to any competition, mate. Holding my, yeah, holding my breath underwater, whatever you try to do, mate, I would give you it. Because I'm a winner myself, but oh, yeah. just knowing, but, yeah, yeah, but just knowing what you came through and what you've went through your whole life, that like, you're solid, man. If I was ever going to get into battle or anything, man, I would want you right by my side because you're 100% loyal. For whatever cause you're fighting for, you know you wouldn't break or bend. And not many, not many times you probably thought, "Fuck this," but <laughs> you had. But like, yeah. how do you feel talking about this whole experience no, and going through it over the last few hours? See, I, I watched you with uh, Sam Miller, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm, I've been offered certain interviews, and I don't think so. There's certain people I wouldn't talk to because I don't like their technique and their confrontational at times. And what I noticed about you, just from an observation, watching the whole Sam Miller interview, you allowed him to speak. Yeah. And you weren't cutting across them, uh, and you, you weren't being prejudgmental, mm -hmm. and that's that's the essence of a good interviewer. I appreciate that because that's yeah, my whole point definitely. is to let people. Everybody's been raised differently. Mm. Everybody's got different race, different religions, different backgrounds. My job is not to judge or challenge. My job is to let people tell it from their side. No matter what you've done or what you've been involved in, my my, my job is to let people understand what you've actually done and why you've done it. Mm -hmm. Because everybody's got it. There's always a catalyst for whatever. Yeah, I've seen anybody can do anything in life. They can mm -hmm. be whoever they want, but certain conditioning to the brain can make you become who you are as well. Yeah, But you can become a product of your environment so many ways. Mm -hmm. And that's why I don't judge. I don't care what the fuck you've done. My yeah. job is just to let you tell your story and to guide it on a journey where people can be, uh, that was amazing. Wow, I'm blown away by that. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Like, yeah. How do you feel about it all now? Are you still bitter towards it all? Um, uh, what had happened was I was lucky. Mm -hmm. The dark wasn't lucky. The, in, in around 1996, 1997, with the war coming to an end, etc. Um, I started going downhill the post-traumatic stress disorder kicked in. Mm -hmm. And um, I was just driving down the Armour Road this day and there was something on the radio and it was a sad song and I started crying. I pulled into Hatfield Street and started crying like a baby and I go, Jesus, I have, I have a fucking job, three jobs to do here today. Why am I getting on like this? And then I started getting feelings where I want to vomit, you know, like <clears throat> bring it all up. And it was just so fucking, it's a bit frightening actually because I was married, I had three kids, it was run the business. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I can't, I can't allow this to happen. And, um, but I went to a friend of mine who's the woman in the pink coat, if you read her. Mm -hmm. she's, the, she's the woman who befriended me in the jail. Mm -hmm. We remain good friends. Is it, it's not Blondie, is it? No. It's the other one, the first, that's the, the girlfriend, isn't it? The what? The girlfriend. No, no. Blondie she, was. Yeah, she was the yeah, girlfriend. Yeah, yeah. But the, the other one was the yeah. board of visitors, mm -hmm. where she came in, the woman in the mm -hmm. pink coat. Yeah. She was the Methodist minister's wife. So we were always stayed close, even when I got out. Mm -hmm. So... She phoned me yesterday and she says, how you feeling now? Are you okay? You, oh, yeah, I don't really feel that well. And she says, what is it? I said, oh, I'm feeling really weird. I'm having like flashbacks, mm -hmm. which I hadn't up until uh, by 96. Here's me, I'm not sure what's happening here. And she says, I have a friend and she's home from Chicago. You call her Helen Seelan. She's a trained psychiatrist. She's late in her 50s and she's an expert on the Vietnam vets because there's nothing in Northern Ireland or these ales that'll deal with people like you. Here's, do you want to see her? Here's me, yeah. So I went up to see her. She was an American psychiatrist called Helen Seelan. And she says to me, um, by 97, that's a year later, it was getting worse. Um, she says, how do you feel? Here's me. <laughs> um, deep down, I actually want to kill myself. But I haven't got the balls to do it. 
But if I had the balls to do it, I wouldn't be around here for much longer. I'd be dead. I want to die. Where do you want to go? I says, I want to be with my comrades. I can't see my purpose anymore in life. Um, so I want to be where they are now. He says, well, see if I give you the tools for recovery. And you make progress. How would you feel about living on this earth for a wee bit longer so that you can educate people and tell people about your dead comrades and set the record straight? And then you can join them. You can leave this world. What do you think of that? Here's me. Can you do that? Yeah. But you have to work with me. You have to work. So you feel like a drowning man. Yeah. I can throw you a life ring. Only if you want it. So yeah, I'll, 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 go, I'll go with that. And she gave me the tools for recovery. So by the signing of the Good Friday Agreement, it was in April 1988, I was coming out the end of a dark tunnel. I had severe post-traumatic stress disorder and she identified that and she gave me the tools for recovery along with dream journals and she was brilliant. And then the, the, uh, this book, uh, Trauma and Recovery by Judith Herman, that was her Bible, she called it. I read that and then read it and then read it and that became my Bible too. It's called Trauma and Recovery by Judith Herman. And um, uh, basically just giving you the tools for how to get out of post-traumatic stress disorder. She says, James, did you know that PTSD, um, that people bandy it about, but um, do you know that it's just, it has been a, a diagnostic category since 1980? Yes, that early? Yeah. It's, it's relatively new. He says, and it really came out of the Vietnam War. Before that, you had um, the Second World War, which was um, battle, battle fatigue. And then First World War was shell shock. But this one, Vietnam War produced this thing called um, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. But it's only been uh, referred to as a diagnostic category since 1980. So it's relatively new. And a lot of people, a lot of the statutory bodies don't know how to handle it. They don't know how to handle it. And But I'm pretty good at it because it did come from the Vietnam War. And I've dealt with a lot of Vietnam vets. And you're suffering the same symptoms they're having. But I came out the other end. So she said to me, is there... It's just a litmus test. Is there anything, that, any poems or anything you want to throw out there from inside yourself, which is profound? Here's me, yeah, there is, but I, I'd be like a drunk man. I couldn't do it. And I couldn't do it then in 1996, 97, 98. Well, 98. Um, she said to me around, it took me near two years, and she says, um, see those, that poem that you have referring to your comrades? Do you think you could do it now? I read a, a line of it and I cried. I read an hour line, I cried. And, and but I came out the other end, out of the dark tunnel. I feel as if like a it was like waking waking out of a dark sleep, you no, know, like a real deep sleep. And you wanted to stretch. It was like like Lazarus. I felt like that's how I felt coming out the other end of PTSD. Um, you don't make a full recovery from it, but the real severe case, you do you do start getting your life back together. Mm -hmm. And you can rationalize and you can articulate stuff. So she says, I want you for this little Lismas test to read that poem again without crying. And that was April 98. Here's me. Go ahead. Then I'll know if you are making progress. And that's it there. It's, uh, it's, it's the most profound of all of them. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's talking to your comrade. Who's mm -hmm. on the other side? And the, one, one of the ten lads was about Bobby. Bobby represents that suffering, represents the ten, represents that sense of loss. And I'm talking to him, but I, I can do it now, and that shows how far I've come. Mm -hmm. It doesn't seem quite so long ago, the last time that I saw you. Isn't it funny how the memories grow? Seems they always fold around you. They tried to break you in a living hell, but they could not find a way. So instead they killed you in a huge black cell and hoped that all would turn away. And they thought your spirit could never rise again, but you dared to prove them wrong. And in death, you tore away our chains to let the world know, hear freedom's song. Yes, the heartache and the pain still linger on. They're still here, though it's so long since you've gone. But we are stronger now. You showed us how. Freedom's fight can be won. I wish there was an easy road to choose to bring this heartache to an end. But easy roads are always sure to lose. I've seen it time and time again. If you could stand by me like yesterday, I'd find the strength to carry on. And with your spirit lighting up the way, I know our day would surely come. But the heartache and the pain still linger on. 
they're still here, though it's so long since you've gone. But we are stronger now. You showed us how. Freedom's fight can be won if we all stand as one. Well done, brother. And to come through all that and, and to want to work on yourself takes strength. But mm -hmm. that just shows you your caliber of who you are. Like you're clearly a fighter. If you if you if wars were right and soldiers were right, that like you would want you on the front line. Mm -hmm. Million percent, like you know how solid you are, like that you would still wouldn't be broken. And that itself is fucking unbelievable. To people break at the slightest thing. We live in an environment where it's such a soft generation. It's actually yeah. easy to be successful because there's so many weak links. Everybody's yeah. solid, even ice is solid until it gets a little heat on it. Mm -hmm. And with you, you've had so much heat on you where you haven't broken. So no matter how long you've got left in this earth, you can hold your head high and go, I fucking I stood what I believed in and nobody fucking broke me. And that there, there's no money, there's nothing in the world that can give you that satisfaction of winning a fight that you truly believed in even though you never thought you would win it at some points but like, it's mad to think that like, what people actually went through in those camps that like, it's sad to see as well how other mm -hmm. humans can treat other humans yeah. like i've stated before that like, there was there's both wrongs on both sides as well there's a lot of destruction from both sides that nobody will ever go over families will be destroyed and there's part of you will live with the pain until the day you day take your last breath but for anybody that's watching it is maybe struggling, that's maybe battling some sort of demons, what advice would you give for them? I would say that there's always light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, when I was going through that in 96, 97, I, nobody told me, you'll come out the other end of that. Well, the psychiatrist, Helen Steelan, said, if, I'll give you the tools for recovery, and if you take the tools, then I will get you out of it. But n n I, hadn't, I never actually heard of anybody who had actually went through the tunnel and come out the other end. Well, I'm the one that did. And... I would like to say to others, you know, if I can do it, and it doesn't matter what side you're on, the British Army, the Irish Republican Army, it doesn't really matter. Soldiers are soldiers are soldiers, and they get involved in wars on all sides. So I'm not going into the, the, the legitimacy of war or the morality of war, but uh, I'm just talking about the, 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 what, how it ends up and how the people that are affected by it, um, how they recover. And there is tools for recovery, and I, I would be a living example of that. And I, I would always like to tell people, you know, in the public domain, you know, if you're struggling out there, look at me. I went through it. I've been in the, I've been to hell, and I come out the other end. And I, I, I am a verification that it can be done. But you do need to have that um, inner strength. You need to have the inner strength that you actually, um, that you can make it. Some people just decide to give up, but you have to dig deeper and deeper and deeper. I've always been able to do that. I, I'll be able. You have to be able to dig inside yourself for that reserve that you that we all have. It's just some of us don't tap into that reserve, but that reserve is there. We all have that extra tank, but a lot of us don't tap into it. They give up. I'm not saying that's a bad thing that they give up, but I'm just saying you need to have that inner strength and you can find that inner strength by that, that self-discovery. Mm -hmm. You have to discover yourself. And, uh, but it can be done. And I mean, it's quite simple. It's not too complex. Um, all I was given was the tools by a certain guide that, who was knowledgeable on that, getting the right people is important. Mm -hmm. The right guy, the, the right person that you're comfortable with. And then for the, for the, to listen to, the, to for, for, for that guidance and for those tools when they're handed to you, take them. Mm -hmm. Just before we finish up, brother, the escape, the prison escape, mm -hmm. what, how many people escaped? Was it 37, 38, 38, 38, 38 people from the hate box? Yeah. How did that happen? Um, well, basically, uh, they were hell-bent on pushing us back to work. And we were hell bent on not wanting to go back to work. That was the final demand. So it was actually Laurie Marley, who was known as the Far Gemal or the, the Devil. He was the mastermind or the architect behind that escape. And once they were forcing us back to work, uh, they were they were the architects of their own destruction, the prison administration, because they were so hell bent on putting these men back to work, just to force it home that. Uh, that there's a semblance, semblance of criminal or criminalization left that Laurie and people like him decided right well, I'll exploit that. So he they actually give Laurie Murray and people around that escape committee the eyes and ears of the camp. So Laurie was traveling into the cement parks. <laughs> he was going into the sewing machine for it. He was getting the whole scan of the whole camp, the whole lay of it, layout through it for them as forcing them back to work. So he used that work. Um uh 
the, the, the fact that they were forcing them back. So he was in the cement works, he was in the sewing factory, he was in the horticulture, he was in the gardens, he was checking the walls, he was checking the Conan Towers. He had a whole bloody mental landscape of that, that whole layout. Whereas before, we knew nothing how that camp was run. We didn't know the layout of it. We didn't know where H5 was or H4. But Larry was able to do a blueprint of it. And he was the architect of it. And we were complaining. I was in H2. This is the irony of this. H7 was now where most of the st staff ended up. And um, and the, the, the escape committee. So we were complaining to the camp staff <laughs> prior to September 83. Why? Is Bick McFarlane allowed out the bumper, the circle, when we aren't? And why is he out at the front gate, <laughs> brushing up? What the hell's going on up there? We're hearing stories that he's having cups of tea with Mister Smiley, and he had seven, the the, the black uh, the black uh, PO. Uh, I mean, does he not forget that there was a hunger strike? Does he for, sorry? Does he does he forget there was a hunger strike in a blanket protest? And then. Why are they so poly poly? The Christmas before, Christmas 82, Mr. Smiley, the PO, Principal Officer, Screw, came in dressed up as Santa Claus to all the boys. And they're all having a great time. <laughs> and there was no answer from H7. Well, we'll get back to you on that. But after the escape, they, they get back and says that was a, a desensitization a desensification program. They were desensitizing them. They were making them friends. <laughs> they were saying to Smitty, come on, have a wee cup of tea. Come on, open that gate while you're at it. They had, the whole well, they had all the gates of the whole block open. And they were able to get information from the screws because the screws were telling them, um, oh, it's such and such, he lives such and such. And, <laughs> and they got a whole layout of the, of the block and the, where the tally lodge was and the whole escape mechanism when the, the lorry came. And, that the, the hardest from the screws. The screws were telling them themselves. Fucking idiots. Idiots. Yeah, idiots. So 30, es 30 escaped. Yeah. So the, the whole security of the block was completely demolished mm -hmm. by the IRA desensification program, which was quite unbelievable. So when the order came, the order was for the, the bumper, go and get, you know, send out the bumper. That was the order for the escape to take place, but it was to shout, send out the bumper. They captured all four wings and the circle. Mm -hmm. And um, carried out a mass breakout. How was it when the H plots got towed down in 2000? Was that there was a lot of motion with that? It was closed in, ju uh, in July 2000. How was that for you when it got demolished? Well, there was a guy <laughs> and said to me in 2006, Do you fancy going back up there? Here's me now, I'm moving on, not backwards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fuck that. You know, yeah, yeah. but he says, What about one, one day only, never to be repeated? Here's me, what do you mean? He says, You and me go back up and look at it because it's going to end up getting. It'll turn into dust. It'll be crumbled. But just for us to say, we triumphed over that. Mm. Be okay, I'll do it. So we went up in June 2006. Myself and Jackie, my partner, and a, a small group of us. But there was a, a tour a tour guide. And he was with the OFMDFM, the, minister, the Stormont government. And he was, brought us actually back to H4, my old block. And he says, this is H4. And, and he went to cell 26. And he says, uh, this is where... Um, they used to put the lockers, and this is cell 26, and um, hang on. Yeah, that's Romper Room. And he says, what's that? I says, that's Romper Room. It's known as Romper Room. Screws called that. We called it Romper Room. Mm. That's, that was the scene of much brutality, but there again, you're going to deny that because it was all self-inflicted. And he says, no. There's me, no. No. He says, we had a group of retired prison officers up here. He says, they're a lot older than you. And he says, um, he says, they wouldn't go in there. And, but he says, one of them ventured and came back out and he says, we carried out some brutality and then prisoners in there. And they all, they all nodded. Here's me. I'm surprised. They actually admit it. Yeah, they're not, they're not publicly admit it, but privately they know what they've done. And he says, um, I says, why are they getting, he says, I think they're reaching the stage in their life where they're looking back in their life and going, Jesus Christ, what the hell do we do? Mm -hmm. But that, that was, that was me coming back in June, 2006. And yeah, I walked in, there was a tree growing in the cell. It's mad. A tree was growing through the mm -hmm. cell. Through a tree mm -hmm. was in the cell. And I says to Joe, <laughs> we've even growing trees in here. Yeah. You know, but yeah, we were able to go back and look at it and go, Yeah, we 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 prevailed. Mm -hmm. So it was a more happy memories. Yeah. It wasn't a negative. But no, but no, it wasn't a negative. But a closure for you. But a closure. Yeah. So how hard is that for you now just to because you've never had any 
won it mitten that you were brutalised and tortured and as nobody's ever came forward and admitted that have they yeah well there's a, th a th so you, this book here this yeah. is what we're touching on is to verify everything that you're saying in this book yeah is a hundred percent yes anything i said in that book uh, can be verified with the international panel it's the report of the independent panel of inquiry into the circumstances of the h black and armad prison protest this was released in october 2020 so um the book i didn't write the book i wrote it in conjunction with this mm -hmm. You know, in other words, I wrote that book, but mm -hmm. that book is well covered, and it's been um, it's been supported by this. Yeah, and th this is the international panel. I give submissions to that, so they mm -hmm. have all the detail in this international panel. Um, the international panel itself it was made up of um, the late Warren Allman, who was the former Solicitor General for Canada, alongside Richard Harvey, Barrister Law and Garden Court. Chambers, London. He also served on the International War Crimes Tribunal at The Hague. And Dr. John Burton, retired family doctor in research into human rights law, access to prisoners' files, the preparation of prisoners' testimonies, legislative research, and access to government documents were administered by Omerky's solicitors. So um, uh, it's basically come up with the findings. Uh, the findings were and I'll just mention it in brief. Mm. Having considered the evidence of former prisoners whose lives remain scarred by physical and psychological suffering and social disabilities, the international panel unhesitatingly concludes that the inhuman conditions in which prisoners were held were calculated to cause intense physical and mental suffering with the intention of humiliating and debasing prisoners and breaking their physical and moral resistance. Further, from the contextual evidence and the expert opinion sought by the International Panel regarding specific types of ill treatment and its impact, its conclusion is that many protesting prisoners in the Hays Blacks and, Ar and Armagh prison were subjected to torture. The British state should reject the proposition that the suffering of former prisoners was not self-imposed or self-inflicted. It was the consequence of a purposeful policy implemented, implemented, implemented by the UK government, whose institutions were fully aware that their policies and practices violated international human rights law and standards and breached common law and statute. The International Panel concludes, based on all the evidence received, that the ultimate legal and moral responsibility for this torture, inhuman and degrading treatment over a protracted period of time within the hate blocks of Long Cash and Armagh Women's Prison, rests on the Prime Minister at 10 Downing Street and senior cabinet ministers who knew and approved of that treatment. Yeah. Seamus, for coming on today, brother, and telling your story. I thoroughly enjoyed it. It's been a long one, but... I think people will get a better understanding and with your book as well I'm going to leave the link in the description for people to buy it mm -hmm. part of this book should be in the history books anyway because it's fact checked and everything is 100% on it yeah. would you like to finish up on anything brother? Um, what do you think? I, um, that's a really I've just got my story out there I'm mm -hmm. just happy I've got everything covered that I wanted to cover yeah I could talk about Brian Furry if you want no no <laughs> he used to sing Brian Furry in the blocks he's <laughs> give me a wee song let's stick the girl <laughs> James again thank you God bless you and good luck to the future no problems thanks very much James thank you